podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is The Tech Guy, episode 1911, recorded Saturday, July 16th, 2022. Enjoy! This episode of The Tech Guy is brought to you by userway.org. Userway is the world's number one accessibility solution, and it's committed to enabling the fundamental human right of digital accessibility for everyone. When you're ready to make your site compliant, deciding which solution to use is an easy choice to make. Go to userway.org twit for 30% off Userway's AI-powered accessibility solution. And by Cisco Meraki. With employees working in different locations, providing a unified work experience seems as easy as herding cats. How do you rein in so many moving parts? The Meraki Cloud Managed Network. Learn how your organization can make hybrid work work by visiting meraki.cisco.com slash twit. And by Cashfly, deliver your video on the network with the best throughput and global reach, making your content infinitely scalable. Go live in hours, not days. Learn more at Cashfly.com. Hello, friends. How are you today? It's time for the Tech Guy Radio Show. Uh, this is a different voice than you're used to, probably. At least is the main voice. Yes, I, Micah Sargent, am filling in for Leo Laporte uh, as he is on a cruise, the Twit Cruise. Uh, I am here with you today to talk TV, the internet, home theater, uh, all sorts of, of devices and things with chips in them, as we say. Of course, that's, that's not it. It's not just devices with chips in them. It's it's AI, it's AR, it's augmented reality. Uh, but we like to take your questions, or in this case, I like to take your questions, and you can call in 888-827-5536. That's 8888-ASK-LEO, hmm. although you'll be asking Micah today. And there you will be able to ask all of the tech questions you have. Uh, as Leo often does, I want to kick things off with a little conversation here about uh, a new <laughs> bit of news from BMW. Have you heard the one about the company, the car company, that is looking to charge its users for things they already own? Yes, it is BMW. BMW <laughs> said, look, we, we, we make these cars, right? And we put uh, heated seats into them. We put, you know, the, the little bits and bops that you have, the extra buttons you can press to do all sorts of things. And why not make a little bit of extra money on those things that we have in there? Yeah, BMW is going to be charging $18 a month, $18 a month for you to use heated seats. It's like car NFTs, except at least in this case, you actually do get something real and you get heat and you're you know, <laughs> in your seat. Uh, so th this is uh, an ongoing kind of conversation that that uh, there's an article from The Verge that really goes into depth about kind of how the automotive industry is doing this in general, how they are kind of looking for ways to make more money. And this is one of those ways, these microtransactions, as they're called, uh, where you may own the device, the product, in this case, the vehicle, but the company wants to continue to make money off of you over time. It's why Apple, that has, has sort of traditionally been a device company, you know, they, they sell iPhones, they sell Macs, they sell these hardware devices, and they make money off of that. But more and more, we see the importance of Apple's services business taking hold. That is the part of the business where you are paying every month. So Apple TV Plus is an example of this. Uh, the idea that you pay for more storage for your iPhone. Those kinds of, of service transactions that continue to bring some money to the company every month so that they can show the uh, folks out there, the investors, that they are sort of viable in the long term, that even if the iPhone falls away, that there's still that. So going back to cars now, you know, you've got BMW that is... It has a long storied history. It's a very you know popular car brand, and uh, people love their BMWs. And I know spend lots of money on repairs of their BMWs. But with that uh, comes this question of okay, so what are we going to do 
if we want to get people to spend money regularly and, you know, the, the way that it kind of used to work is you would bundle in services like XM Radio, where, yes, uh, the XM Radio service was making most of the money off of that, but the car companies would get a little money kind of on the front end uh, for offering the subscription service in the vehicle and, you know, providing the hardware there. So BMW was like, hey, let's... Um, Let's find a way for us to make money directly. And this is the thing. It's not just uh, it's not just the heated seats where you pay every month for a thing that is already built into your car, <laughs> might I add. You know, it's not like you're paying a monthly subscription and they come and install it and you're leasing those little heated coils. No, 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 no. These are already in your car. But BMW is also, uh, they've got a service that is going to allow, let's see what it is. Um heated steering wheels uh, from $12 a month. Uh, now, this one, I think, makes a little bit more sense. Recording footage from your car's cameras. So, in your car, you've uh, th these BMWs are equipped with cameras. Sure. Charge for that because it's probably a cloud storage service, so it's going to go into the cloud, and you got to pay for that upkeep. That makes sense. But then, <laughs> there's also uh, the ability to play engine cars in your in engine sounds rather in your car for a one-time fee of $117. Yes. Uh, BMW says just, you know, th this isn't a subscription service. You just pay it once and then it's there. But this has me thinking about all the different ways that uh, people discover how to hack these kinds of things, how to sort of circumvent this. Because there's a difference between, you know, I've got at home a, uh, a, a water service. So every once in a while, the service comes by and drops off a couple of uh, big old, I think they're five gallon jugs of water, right? And I don't own the dispenser that's inside of my home. I lease it. It's like two bucks a month or something. Every month I pay two bucks for that. And I pay, you know, 10 bucks for the water. They come and they bring the water. That makes sense. I don't already have the water dispenser, so I'm paying for that. But if you buy the car and the car already has the heated seats inside and now you're charging me every month to use them, that that just doesn't make sense to me. And I think that's how a lot of people are feeling about this. And I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see some OBD2 ports. Those are those onboard diagnostic uh, ports on cars that uh, you typically you go to uh, a dealer and they plug something in there. They can update the firmware on the car. They can check why the car's engine light is on, that kind of thing. Uh, if we see some OBD2 hacks with this where people aren't being forced to pay for a thing they already own, it's just... It's really disappointing to see this uh, play out in in the automotive space because this isn't the only area. You know, I have a, a, a long history of smart tech um, purchasing and and uh, research, and this is pretty popular in uh, in that space where you will get a device and it can do a thing, but then you have to pay extra for it to do that thing. It's different from these apps these you know these games that we have where it makes sense that this is a is a long term investment this is you know the the app when you're paying the subscription price you are investing in the developer that is creating that app and making sure that the app continues to to be made over time that's a whole different kind of thing and it, it what it looks to me is that these automotive folks are going you know I'm kind of jealous <laughs> that these other companies are able to do these prolonged transactions and keep making money. And so let's figure out a way for us to do that. But they've done it in a way that makes no sense. And I think that's part of the reason why this is not in the United States yet. This feature is not yet in the U.S. It is uh, in, in the U.K. I think it's in uh, New Zealand, if I remember correctly. It's in quite a few other places, but they have not brought it to the U.S. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention, automatic high beams and adaptive cruise control were also some of those subscription features. I don't think we should put somewhat uh, considered safety features <laughs> behind a paywall. That doesn't make any sense. That's not okay. But um, as I think some of the folks in the chat are saying, I shouldn't be surprised 
this is business as usual. This is how uh, these things typically go. And people just, uh, you know, they, they, they are looking for new ways to make money. They're looking for ways to continue to charge. And I think that we're going to continue to see kind of a step away from the idea that you make a one-time purchase and then that is the extent of the conversation that you have with that company. I mean, you know, don't ask me your questions about printers, but <laughs> printers are one of those examples where they don't make money off of the device itself. They make money off of those ink cartridges that you have to keep buying from them that are locked down, locked tight, and are only available through that. So I am not surprised to see this, but um, I still am disappointed. <laughs> BMW, look, I'm disappointed. In any case, uh, thank you for being here today. 8888-ASK-LEO, 888-827-5536. Stay tuned. <laughs> Adele, I love you. Thank you for joining us today on The Tech Guy. I am Micah Sergeant <laughs> Filligan for Leo Laporte today. And uh, it is time to go to the phones with Kim Schaffer. Kim, can you sing that song? You, you a Not singer? well. I can sing it, but nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> okay, so you and I should get together and sing. Do, yeah. do some karaoke or something because I'm not have same the voice boat. of a uh, an angel, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you are our phone angel, oh, and that's what you. matters. Hello from the other side of the building. <laughs> <laughs> Hello to you, Kim. And uh, thank you for being here oh, with me yes. today. You know, I feel a little bit more comfy because I know that you're there. I'm like a safety blanket. You are like <laughs> a safety blanket to make sure that none of the meanies get through <laughs> as we take calls. Again, I just want to remind everyone, 8888-ASK-LEO. But uh, Kim, uh, who should we talk to on the phone today? Let's talk to Brandon in Eagleville. You're going to help him with his Chrome bookmarks. All right. <laughs> Chrome let's, bookmarks. let's do it. Brandon in Eagleville. Hello, Hi, Brandon. I call. Yeah. Happy to have you here. I call. And yeah. And I, just before I get to my question, I just want to say you're doing a great job and I'm just so happy that Leo, you know, kind of picked you to go into this role because I enjoy you on iOS today and, oh. and I think it's just a, a great job. So congratulations. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Brandon. So yeah, I would uh, love to help you out here today. What's your question for us? So I've been using Chrome for probably more than 10 years, like a lot of people. And over that time, I've accumulated quite a bit of bookmarks. I'd say there's probably hundreds in there. Um, and, you know, organizing them now has been quite a chore. So I was wondering if you had any suggestions. I know there's probably, um, you know, like... Uh, extensions that can do this, but I know, you know, Leo in the past said you got to be careful of them. I'm looking for a way to, one, go through and if there was some way could check to see if all those bookmarks were still valid, because if they're not, you know, a hacker might have taken over a website, you go there and you potentially get exposed to a virus or malware. And then two, can it also look and see if I have duplicated bookmarks and kind of help me try to clean them up? Ah, okay. So you're looking for a way to clean up your bookmarks uh, that is right. safe as well. Um, let's let's take a look in the uh, chat. We've got some links in from uh, Scooter X, who has some thoughts because yeah, that is one of the concerns, right? Is you get a uh, an add-on, you get a Chrome extension, and then it ends up doing something hinky that you don't want done to your computer. That can be exactly. a bit of an issue. Because um, what I'm seeing uh, in terms of support from Chrome itself is go through and find the ones that are duplicates on your own. But no, we don't want to do that. Um, obviously, we'd like to, to have a way to, to do this. So there are some methods um, for using tools that can help you. Uh, one example is that you export your Chrome bookmarks and then you uh, either import that into Google Sheets or Excel if you have it, and then use okay. a formula, um, which you can look it up, uh, duplicate detection uh, formula for Google Sheets. Just Google that or duplicate detection formula for Excel. And it can help you find the you know repeat URLs or the repeat titles. I know, though, that that doesn't go as far as you want in terms of finding ones that are uh, super in-depth, that, you know, that uh, have issues or don't have issues. Uh, and there are a couple 
of different bookmark extensions that uh, Lifehacker, for example, recommended. Um, okay. There's one that's called Super Sorter. And now it's funny. The first thing they say is careful with this one. And it's not what you think it. It's not because there's something wrong with it. It's called super sorter uh, because it is, or rather they they give that, that warning because it is going to be your tool for managing your bookmarks. And it immediately starts working. Uh, Once you let, it says, once you let super sorter do the magic, uh, it starts to clean things up and tidy them. And it will automatically delete duplicates. It will empty bookmark folders that don't have anything in them. And it is uh, a very powerful tool. So that's super sorted. There's another one that's called Spruce Marks. And Spruce Marks is a little bit, it it doesn't uh, take over. Uh, It it leaves you in charge, but it also can help you find those duplicates. And those ones, um, I think, can be, you know, again, when you're looking through and trying to find ones that you want to make sure you can trust, I totally understand why uh, you'd have that concern. But um, those those two seem good. And of course, uh, we will include some links uh, in the show notes, which you can find at techguylabs.com. Um, and there are actually... That's great. Thank you so much for your help. And yeah. have a great rest of your show. You as well. Thank you so much. All right. So that was our first call. Let us go to, ah, let's go to Kelvin, who is calling in from San Diego. Hello, Kelvin. Hey, Micah. How you doing, man? Oh, I'm doing well. How are you today? I'm good. It's the best day of my life. Yesterday, I'm not here no more. <laughs> Mom's not here yet. It's the best day of the day. Yeah, absolutely. And what is it that you say about your name? It's uh, there. There are no zeros. I can't remember how it goes. There's no negative in the Greek Kelvin. That's right. There's, There's no, no negative words. here. I love that. I love that. <laughs> uh, how you doing, so, Kel- Kelvin? I have a. Go ahead. I was just asking how you're doing. I'm doing all right. Doing all right. It's been a, one of the, the been a big order that came in and trying to get that out and getting. Ready for this tonight? I'm going to be interviewed on the radio tonight. Oh, fantastic! So I'm calling in um, to see, like, how, how does this work, and and do I sound good? Can I have you plugged into my mixer? Mm-hmm. And I'm using my podcast mic and into my phone. Um, well, the only issue I have is that there's a lag between you and I. Okay, so it's causing. So any any ideas? Hmm. So what you're saying is, uh, in the phone, when you are monitoring yourself uh, with your headphones or whatever you happen to have, um, where is the lag coming in? What? How does it? Like how? Do, how can you tell that there's a lag? Rather. Well, I, I think this is the first time where I've used a mic, like a microphone, uh, like an actual podcast microphone. Got it. Into a phone and. You know how when you're talking to the microphone, you can hear yourself in the headset? Yes. And so I can hear myself, but you're not louder than myself. So I, I think I have to turn my speaker system down, would you say? That would be a good idea. I think, too, um, if you're using, are you are you plugging directly into the phone or are you going through a mixer? Uh, and then the mixer is plugged into the phone. Okay, that's good. Yeah, mixer. yeah, so you want the headphones plugged into the mixer, you want the microphone plugged into the mixer, and then the phone, of course, is also uh, part of that process. As long as everything's going from your end out, then you know that it's working. Um, but... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about the lag per se, uh, but we are mm-hmm. coming up to a break that we need to take. Uh, Micah Sargent in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More questions soon after Scott Wilkinson. Stay on the line, Kelvin. No worries. All right, Kelvin. So you mentioned uh, speakers. I, I I missed that part. So are you listening through speakers or are you listening through headphones? No, I'm I'm using my Bose headphones. Um, so I have them plugged into because um, they fit right really nicely on my hearing aids, and I can get them right into the microphone on my hearing aids. And so um, I have them plugged into my mixer, and then I have the microphone plugged in the mixer, and then the iPhone is plugged into the channel three, which is the 
T T R. Oh, gotcha. Okay, or yeah. So the, I was like, better be wired rather than Bluetooth. Cause I found that that's even worse. But I think what I think I figured it out. I turned down my my volume to the headset and then turned you up so I could hear you better. Mm-hmm. Um. So my question is, do I sound okay to you? Yeah, you sound great to me. And of course, you okay. are you're going in through a call, so a call is always going to be compressed, um, no yeah. matter no matter what. And, and of course, depending on the technology that you're using, if you are using one of those services uh, that is doing voice over IP, of course, it's going to be a little bit better a VoIP call. But yeah. as long as you're calling in on a you know a line like that, it's going to be a little bit compressed. But yeah, you sound good. I think the only thing that I notice is there's a little bit of um, noise cancellation gating that takes place as you are talking and uh, stop talking. But I think if you're having a regular conversation that's back and forth, that's not going to be something they're going to pick up on. Okay. Okay. All right. So that's good. So good to know these things because I tell you, I don't want to call and get into the radio and me and mid any of you of this show and be like, Oh no. <laughs> yeah, I totally understand. No, I think you sound great. I think uh I think it's going to it's going to go well and uh Kelvin break a leg today. Uh congratulations on awesome. uh, your radio interview. Yes, awesome man. I really appreciate it. And you're doing a great job. I I'm, I'm, I'm excited that you're here. I oh, thank you so getting much. Getting the opportunity to do this cuz uh experience always comes with more strength. So thank you so much Kelvin. Thank you. So, all right. You have a good one, man. You as well. Bye-bye. All right. All right. Hello, Scotty. Hello, Micah. How you doing, man? Ooh, I'm all right. I'm, I'm all right. I, uh, I th- oh, it's going yeah. okay. <laughs> first time first time on the big ball. Huh? Yeah, first time. Exactly. First time on the big ball and, uh, you know, moving all the, the sliders and making oh, yeah, sure everything's man. getting covered. So I, I got to <laughs> tell you, I... I was so excited. It's among the most fun I've ever had when, when I subbed for Leo. The, oh yeah, have you have you done yeah. radio outside of uh, outside of that? Uh, not very much, no. But uh, way back when, when he was in the uh, cottage, mm-hmm. uh, he would uh, take a vacation, and he actually asked me to sub for him, and I did it. I don't know, a dozen times since then. Nice. And it's so much fun. It's very exciting. You, you. I will tell you this: the time will fly so fast. I was going to say, I'm already noticing that. Yeah, it's it's like, wait, we're already this far into it. Yep, <laughs> yep. It's going to just zip on by really fast. That is one of the things but. I love. Is uh, I, you know, I used to work in a, a newsroom, and uh, we would have breaking news happen, and the newsroom mm-hmm. energy just changes in those moments. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. this yeah. has that sort of feel of having all these different parts and pieces that need to get adjusted and moved around, which mm-hmm. I, I very mm-hmm. much enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're doing a great job, man. Thank you. That's very kind. Really great. Really great. Oh, doing my best. This episode of The Tech Guy is brought to you by userway.org. Every website, without exception, it has to be accessible. Userway's incredible AI-powered solution, it tirelessly enforces the hundreds of WCAG, that's WCAG, uh, guidelines. In fact, in a matter of seconds, UserWay AI can achieve more than an entire team of developers can in months. At first, it may seem kind of overwhelming to make your website accessible, trying to figure out all of those steps, making sure that you are compliant, but UserWay's solution makes it simple. It makes it easy and it makes it cost effective, most importantly. You can even use their free scanning tool to see if your website is ADA compliant. And if you have an enterprise-level website with thousands of pages, that's where UserWay can really come into play. UserWay offers a managed solution where their team can handle everything for you. UserWay's AI and machine learning solutions power accessibility for more than one million websites. You're wondering who? Well, it's trusted by Coca-Cola. I'm sure you've heard of them. Disney, eBay, FedEx, and many other leading brands. Now, UserWay is making the best-in-class, enterprise-level accessibility tools available to small and medium businesses like you. 
You can get started today for as little as $49 a month on UserWay's monthly plan. Your company can be ADA compliant, reach more customers, and build loyalty. And remember, you get 30% off. There are 1 billion people in the world with disabilities. That's roughly 13% of the population that you don't want to lose as potential customers because you're not compliant. Think about it. By not being compliant, fines and revenue lost will cost you so much more. And frankly, it's just the right thing to do. That's so important. UserWay, it's the leading accessibility solution in the market today with a market share of 61%. Wowza, the biggest in the world. For years, UserWay has been on the cutting edge creating innovative accessibility technologies that push the envelope of what's possible using AI, machine learning, and computer vision. UserWay's AI automatically fixes violations at the code level. UserWay, it's platform agnostic, and it integrates seamlessly with WordPress, with Shopify, with Wix, with Sitecore, with SharePoint, and so much more. Let UserWay help your business meet its compliance goals and improve the experience for your users. Oh, and by the way, the voice of Siri, Susan Bennett, has a message about UserWay. Hi, I'm Susan Bennett, the original voice of Siri. You won't hear me say something like this too often. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're looking for. But every day, that's what the internet is like for millions of people with disabilities. UserWay fixes all of that with just one line of code. UserWay can make any website fully accessible and ADA compliant. With UserWay, everyone who visits your site can browse seamlessly and customize it to fit their needs. It's also a perfect way to showcase your brand's commitment to millions of people with disabilities. Go to userway.org slash twit and get 30% off UserWay's AI-powered accessibility solution. UserWay, making the internet accessible for everyone. Visit userway.org slash twit today. And thanks so much to UserWay for sponsoring this week's episode of The Tech Guy. Back to the show. All righty, folks. Welcome back to the show. Yes, I, Micah Sargent, am in for Leo Laporte today, uh, who is cruising. Uh, but uh, I am happy to be joined by the one, the only, Scott Wilkinson, home theater <laughs> geek. Hello, Scott. <laughs> hey, Micah. Welcome to the big, the big ball. Uh... <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a blast thus far, and as as we were talking about a little bit before the show, uh, it's just zooming right on by. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to take it all in. That's for sure. Please do. Yes, yes. Experience. Bring it all in. It's it's a wonderful experience. I. I value my opportunity to do that when Leo was out, and now you get to do it, and I'm so happy for you. Thank you so much, Scott. So uh, it looks like you've been kind of busy over on AVS Forum. I have, I have. I uh, Last week we did uh, our latest podcast, uh, this time with um, Andrew Jones, who uh, longtime listeners will recognize as one of the world's preeminent speaker designers. Uh, he worked for a bunch of companies, starting with Kef uh, in England, and then Infinity, Pioneer, TAD, uh, and ELAC most, most recently, although he recently moved from there to MoFi, which is short for Mobile Fidelity. And you go, wait a second, Mobile Fidelity is a record label. They make audiophile LPs. So what is a speaker designer doing at, at a at a record label. Well, they happen to have an electronics division and they make turntables, of course, because they also make vinyl records. So they decided they wanted to make some speakers too. And so they hired Andrew Jones to help them develop their speaker business. Now, we couldn't really talk about the speakers that he's making because they haven't been revealed yet and it's kind of under wraps. So we didn't talk about that, but what we did talk about was his general philosophy of speaker design. And one of the things that, that I found very interesting is that he really likes what are called concentric drivers. And what that means is you put a, a tweeter at the center of a mid-range driver. And what that does is it allows a wider range of frequencies to come from the same location oh. uh, in the speaker, which, which gives it a, a character and an advantage really over multi-driver speakers, which most are, 
that have the the tweeter in one place and the mid range in another place, and that causes some problems. And the with the coincident driver fixes. So uh, it was a fascinating discussion. Andrew's a great guy. I've I've known him for many years, and uh, he's he's done very interesting things all the way from. Hundred thousand dollar a pair speakers cost no object. He could do anything he wanted, down to a hundred dollar a pair speakers at Pioneer, and he was he became very famous for ringing an amazing sound out of a hundred dollar a pair speakers from Pioneer. So uh, it's a fascinating discussion, and I encourage people to go check it out because uh, he's he's a very interesting guy. He's got a lot of cool things to say. So. Uh, that's up there on AVS Forum. Yeah, I'm kind of uh, curious yeah. now to hear about, because uh, I would think, I, I would immediately wonder if putting a tweeter in the middle of the of the other type of speaker would mm -hmm. result in distortion or something like that, where you've got uh, two different sound waves competing. Yep, yep, and he talks about that. Cool. He absolutely does. That, that how, how to solve that problem. Awesome. Because uh, it is a problem. So, yeah, check it out. Uh, the other thing on AVS Forum that I just posted uh, yesterday uh, is I've now started to do a monthly feature on AVS Forum called Home Theater of the Month. As you can imagine, AVS Forum, which is a community of audio-video enthusiasts, a lot of them build their own home theater. And some of them go to great lengths. Uh, and so we like to feature some of these home theaters that, that people have spent so much time and so much money on. And uh, I'm really happy to be back doing that because I really find the, the process fascinating and how these people solve various problems really, really interesting. So uh, David McKay is the owner of this particular theater. Uh, he waited 25 years before he could afford to build a home theater as he was building his his uh, forever home in Florida. He He's a stock trader, stock and bond trader, and he made enough money to move to Florida and build a whole home and build a whole home theater. And uh, he he really did a great job. It's, it's a beautiful theater with... Uh, surround speakers and overhead speakers. So it's an Atmos system, uh, you know, this immersive audio that I'm sure you've heard me talk about before. And um, with, a, with a really nice projector, JVC projector onto a 138 inch screen, which as most of these theaters are, is a, a acoustically transparent screen with the speakers and the subwoofers behind the screen as it is in a commercial cinema. Now, um, this theater was not cheap. <laughs> I asked him how much it was to, to actually build it and equip it with all the equipment that's in there. He said, well, it's not, I'm not really sure because it was all wrapped into building the whole house. Uh, but he figured maybe $125,000. So not all of my home theater of the months are going to be, you know, that super expensive because who can, very few people can afford that relatively. He can because he's he worked for 25 years to specifically to be able to afford that. Um, so there will be others that I will feature that are still great, but that like people built themselves with their own hands. In mm -hmm. this case, he he contracted out most of the work. Oh, I was um, wondering because this is very intense stuff. I mean, yeah, adding yeah. in insulation and uh, drywalling yeah. and going all in with yeah. the wiring and everything. It's gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it's gorgeous. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, theater. Um, and, you know, he, he, like I said, he contracted most of it out. You can do it for less <clears throat> if you, you know, if you do it yourself. Now, the, the coolest part of this theater, I mean, one of the coolest parts, he's got the ceiling, yes! right? You, you saw, we, did you see that? Oh we just got a Oh, my gosh. It's a two-layer ceiling. It, I mean, it's a one layer, but when the lights are on in the room, it looks like a blue sky with puffy white clouds. Really, really nice. But you turn the lights out, and it becomes a starry night sky. It's like, what? That is, and they're so amazing, the idea that when the lights are uh, not on, like during the day, it can charge with the UV lights that, that he has set right. up. That's right. so smart. Right, right. The, the stars in the Starry Night version are, are painted with uh, phosphorescent paint. 
Wow. Right? So that they absorb light during the day or when the lights are on. And then when you turn the lights out, then they glow. And, you know, it's not distracting for a movie, but it's just a wonderful, a wonderful nice ambience. Yeah, 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 yeah. The other really cool thing about this theater, it's parked right in the middle of his garage. It's basically a room in a room, within a room in his garage. And he can drive his cars around it. Yeah, I saw the, um, the the little layout guides. I can't think of what those are called, but uh, where it shows the cars can be kind of anywhere around the outside of it. And yep. that, that room inside is is right there. That's And that right. way, too, it can be as loud as you want it to be, kind of separated exactly from the home. Exactly so. Exactly so. And he took a lot of care in making sure that the sound isolation was very good. So, it you know, you could be playing it at 120 decibels in there. I don't recommend that. But you could, and you would probably not hear anything outside the theater. Wow. And what uh, what kind of projector is inside of this? To- it's a JVC a DLA RS500. It's, uh, I don't know, a couple years old now. Uh, but it's a 4K projector, oh. and I'm sure it looks fantastic. I'm sure it does. Well, it's time to take a break, but thank you so much, Scott Wilkinson. We'll be back right after this. You bet. There it is. (laughs) Nice. I was a little early. (laughs) All right. I remember when my job was fun. (laughs) Like when you were writing about this cool theater. Exactly. That was actually really fun. Yeah, that's neat. Um, That the projector. I get is that it up between the these two speakers or whatever's going is Let's this see, the projector wait, wait, right here? Uh, where where am I? I'm on a zoom. Oh, no, yeah, zoom. <sighs> yeah, you can see the projector up there uh near the roof. The two lighter panels on either side of it are uh, uh acoustic panels. Ah, so they those are like acoustically transparent. There are speakers inside, something like that. No, no, they're actually probably Dead absorbers or diffusers. It. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. The, the surround speakers that you can at the next picture you can see one of the rear surround speakers with its cover removed if you scroll down just a little bit mm-hmm. oh right uh, there you can yeah there you can see one of the rear surrounds right next to the wet bar <laughs> yeah you wouldn't um, want to be popping popcorn during the show no but no certainly but you before. got the, that lovely microwave there you can pop up a bunch of popcorn there's also a, a little sub zero mini fridge in that in that wet bar. Uh, for all your cold beverages. That's really nice. That is very oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He did a great job. He kind of really jealous did a great for sure. Job. I know I am too. <laughs> <laughs> I just got a submission. And by the way, if any of you out there have a, a true dedicated home theater, which is what this column's about, whether or not you built it yourself or had it built, paid to have it built, uh, you can send an email to HT of the month at avsforum.com and uh, you know say hey I got a theater I'd love for it to be considered send me a few pics I monitor that email and um, we are looking for submissions we already have a bunch actually I will, I'll probably be busy well into next year with these but uh, there was one that just came in it's my kind of home theater totally blacked out I mean the whole room is just painted essentially black wow and that's my kind of home theater uh i i mean these these ones with a lot of design and rosewood or mahogany or whatever are very nice but not your style or not, not my not what personal you want, style because you're wanting the I, best picture that you could possibly get right and you and can exactly get that if it's, right if it's all black yeah that correct 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 and so that that's what my home theater at in my previous home in Burbank was was about, and uh, now that we have a new house we're moving to, oh, yeah, we will right. uh, we will uh, have sort of a dedicated theater, not a not a complete room, but I do have a an area that's that's going to be dedicated to a home theater, and I'm going to paint it dark gray. You know, my wife has complete control over the entire house. Except my office and the, the the viewing room. Everything else, she can do whatever she wants. Fine with me. 
Um, but I'm going to paint that area what's called Munsell gray. It's a it's a very neutral gray. It has no hue to it. It's a specific uh, paint color, mm -hmm. uh, and that and if and a matte, not a glossy, so it absorbs light. It does not reflect much light at all. The uh, the room I had in Burbank, it was nine percent reflective. Oh uh, wow! When you turn when you turn the lights out in there, it's a black hole. All right, which is um, what you want. Will you be sticking around for the top of the show? You bet. Yeah, Happy thank to. you, Scott. And actually, you might My stick pleasure. around for a second too, because there's a question that you might want to. Oh with. yeah, cool man. Ah, uh, hello, and welcome back to the Tech Guy. You may be going, whose voice is that? Well, it's Micah Sargent's voice, who is subbing in for Leo today. Leo Laporte is taking uh, a cruise, and so I, Micah Sargent, am Tech Guy also, as they say, uh, here to answer your calls live on the radio. 888-827-5536. ask leo Our next call comes from... Kenny in Cottontown, Tennessee, who wants to know about, well, let's find out. Hello, Hello Kenny. Micah. There we go. There's Kenny. Hi, Kenny. How are you? Oh, I'm doing good. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a sidebar. I saw you kind of jamming along with Adele on the live stream. <laughs> I just got done listening to Adele uh, go easy on me on Rick D's weekly top 40 on a radio station online in Canada, which was actually one of my two questions, but the, I'll go ahead and get started with the first one, which is the explain a 4k UHD Blu-ray disc on an external Blu-ray drive on the Mac studios. You know, I just bought me a Mac studio not too long ago mm -hmm. and I can play regular Blu-ray discs just fine. It's not that's not the problem. It's the 4K UHDs, and I was calling to see if you kind of know if there's a way around it through a Mac. I know that with Windows PC, uh, you can use like CyberLink Power DVD. As a matter of fact, I just downloaded uh, the Ultra HD Blu-ray Advisor to see if maybe if I could play it through Parallels on Windows 11. And unfortunately, I'm missing a lot of themes, including uh, HBVC 10 AVC codec, mm -hmm. HDCP 2.2, uh, advanced protected GPU, and of course, I have the optical disk drive. But I was just kind of calling to see if you knew any workarounds of playing not regular Blu-ray, but 4K UHD Blu-rays on a Mac. Yeah, so uh, we still have Scott here, and you know our home theater geek knows quite a bit about this hey, kind of Scott. thing. And I, I'm <laughs> curious, Scott. Uh, the, the big thing here is, is there what's what's the risk? I guess not risk per se, but what's the downside if there is of playing this kind of content on a PC or a Mac versus playing it on uh, you know a, a big TV with uh, external hardware? Is there any difference between the two? I. I I wouldn't think so. I must admit, I don't have a lot of experience with playing Blu-rays and Ultra HD Blu-rays on a computer. My first question that came to mind was, well, does does that drive itself support Ultra HD Blu-ray? I don't know. Well, uh, I can tell you my uh, external drive real quick is an Archon Premium Aluminum External USB 3.0. That's the one that I'm using. It's also a super drive. Okay, but does it, do you know, do the specs include that it can actually play a UHD Blu-ray? Uh, let me, I can pull it up real quick. Yeah, it's a... Uh, That's the question. It can read if it, it, UHD. It, it says it can read it, but okay. it, it won't be able to write it. That's the big... Okay, well, that doesn't matter. You, you just want to play a commercial UHD Blu-ray. And if it says it can read it, then it can read it. So then the question becomes, how do you get it? Now, what are you watching it on? What's the display? Well, I'm watching it on an external monitor is basically what I'm... What is model? it a 4K monitor? Yeah, is it a 4K UHD monitor? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm seeing some, some folks who are saying that VLC might come uh, into play here. VLC uh, mm -hmm. is a very popular app. Uh, VLC, I think it's VLC.org. Um, and... Essentially, because it's open source, it has a lot of. Uh, let me see, Video Land Project. Um, yeah, it's got a, it's got a lot of co contributors 
helping it along. Yeah, videoland.org. Um, and I, so I've used VLC for years. Anytime I have a problem with a file that's a video file that I can't open on my computer, um, I will use VLC to, to get access to it. Um, but what VLC is also good at is being able to kind of go around some of the built-in confusion that might exist on the operating system to be able to play those files in the original uh, way that they were intended to be played. So, yeah, mm -hmm. if you have a drive that truly can support um, the, you know, UHD play back, then you should be able to do this. There's no difference between a Mac, but I am going to include a link in the show notes at techilabs.com um, from Apple. And Apple has a kind of a guide to go through to make sure that HDR content is playing correctly on your Mac, mm -hmm. that everything's working out uh, as you need it to, because it could just be a matter of, of settings. And honestly, this is one of those things where I'm sure Scott's very familiar with. Uh, sometimes it comes down to the cable. If it's uh, HDR. That was my next question. Right. Yeah. <laughs> How are you plugging <laughs> Uh, that might be that might be another way that I may need to go and get me another cable because I do have plenty of those lying around. But I do have one little quick question, and yeah, I'll we can do get one more. the air. Um, geo blocking um, in terms of Canada radio. Uh, I, I mentioned I do listen to internet radio, and I noticed that on TuneIn that some of the marquee Canada radio stations, like say Virgin Radio out of Calgary have some sort of restriction on them where you can't play them unless there's a little trick there that's like a VPN, mm -hmm. which kind of tricks or spoofs the location. Now, mm -hmm. I did read an article, this is probably going back to 2014, that it may have to do with music licensing. Is that the main reason why like, the big ones that are on, like, let's say, a Rogers or a, a Bell Media, that you can't listen to them on, let's say, a TuneIn or Apple Music? I mean, this is that, that's the problem is that all of these, uh, you, while on the front of it, it looks like you're just paying Apple Music uh, subscription uh, fee and that Apple Music is handling all this. But what the real case is, is that on the other side of this, there are lots of people in suits like mine and probably ones that cost a lot more <laughs> who are all making these deals happen. And these deals expire all the time and they change all the yep. time and the regions yep. change all the time and the moments. I mean, just the other day, I had a, a friend of mine who, was tw who tweeted and said, you can actually go into uh, Apple Music on your Mac and you can create a playlist, a smart playlist, which is a playlist that automatically sorts, that shows music that is no longer available because those deals have changed. So mm -hmm. honestly, uh, Kenny, I can't, I, I can't answer that question because I don't know what okay. it is, but you are right on track in terms of it is probably that. It is probably some sort of uh, region restriction uh, and Honestly, that's one of the reasons why when we've talked about VPNs on our network, uh, we've had you know sponsors, ExpressVPN. One of the things that we talk about that is a benefit of uh, a VPN is the ability to, um, you know, appear in different places uh, as you might need to for whatever reason you might need to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but Kenny, well, thank you. That for a Leo question, but uh, thanks for taking my call. I really appreciate it. And I'll keep in mind on the... VLC part of it and may try that. Yeah, yeah. Let me know how VLC goes for you. That's at videolan.org. Videolan.org. All right. You having a good show. Thank you so much. All right. It is time for a break. Zonk. You know that whole uh, that whole region thing gets gets me in Netflix and and all this video streamers mm -hmm. when stuff appears and then disappears. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know because again it's a licensing right, deal. I had that happen right in the middle. Um, I th one of the greatest shows on television is, in my opinion, is the Australian version of Survivor. Survivor, that really? sort of reality TV show. Australia yeah, yeah. has its own version and okay. it is so good. And my partner and I were watching it for a season, like two or three seasons. And mm -hmm. I remember it was Valentine's Day and we were three quarters of the way through the <sighs> final episode of oh the season. Oh my God. And literally in the middle of the episode, 
it turned to be what? it turned to be like 6 p.m. and uh, the thing popped up and it said this video is not available and I thought I of course you know immediately went to processing and I'm like this is not right. uh, this is not an internet issue because this was right at a specific time I bet this right. is and then I went on Twitter and started to see people complaining about it and then I reached out to the support and they're like yeah we don't have the rights to this anymore and I'm like you can't As do it in the middle of an episode yeah it's like what. I hate that. I really, really hate that. And there's nothing we can do about it. Nope. It's not fair. Because it's, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not fair. Especially when the, the show, like, like I said, uh, let me at least finish the episode. I feel like yeah. that should be in the contract that if someone's in the yeah. middle of it, they've already downloaded it to the buffer on their set top box. Let yep. them finish the episode. Yeah, for God's uh, sake. <laughs> so frustrating. Oh man. All right. If I've got my chart uh, correct, this is your uh this is your time, right? This is my top of the hour. Yay. All right. Well, <laughs> I will, You get to get you get to take a break. I get to go get some coffee. I will pull go up get the some shot coffee. clock for you and then okay. it is all Oh, yours. thank you. That's very nice. Having that clock is so helpful. Yes, and it is. You have it in your view, right? While you're while you're uh, I do. doing your thing. Good. Yeah. That's really when I was in your chair, that was super helpful to know how much time I had left. Because otherwise you don't you lose track of time. You're just talking to somebody on the phone and you're having a good time. And all of a sudden you hear the music come up and you're in the middle of a thought and you go, Oh, okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so good. Well, go get some coffee, Thank man. Thank you very much. All right. Hey everybody. So nice to see you. Um, I think Mike is doing a fantastic job here. And uh, let's see. Tim Elliott, have you heard the latest from Mobile Fidelity? People are up in arms that they've been mastering vinyl from digital sources. No, I hadn't heard that. Although I, I have heard that in general, that, that that is often the case. And it may be unavoidable uh, because... A, there aren't very many people recording audio in analog anymore. There are a few, but not many. Um, so, and even if they did, they they end up mastering to digital. Um, now, a company like Mobile Fidelity, I would think, would stay in the analog domain all the way across because they 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 know they're going to end up on vinyl, which is an analog format, and so. If they're recording from, if they're recording the music in the studio, I would expect them to record on analog, keep it in analog through the mastering process, mixing and mastering process, and then cut the vinyl in uh, in the final stage. Um, I, now that I have a connection into Mobile Fidelity <laughs> with Andrew Jones, he's not with a record label, he's with Mo MoFi Electronics, but I'm sure he can get me into contact with somebody at the record label. Uh, one of the things he said in the po in my podcast that I didn't mention on the air is that Mobile Fidelity just opened a vinyl pressing plant. Uh, I don't remember where it is. It's in the U.S. somewhere. And that's great news because there was a big vinyl pressing plant in L.A. that burned down a couple of years ago. I think it was called Apollo, uh, which left only a, like one or two pressing plants in the world. Uh, one of them was in Japan. So now Mobile Fidelity has its own pressing plant. And so, you know, that actually I just had this idea of maybe getting somebody from Mobile Fidelity in, on, the record, on the record label side to come on and be on my podcast. And I could ask him this very question. Now, I don't want to be too confrontational about it, but uh, it, it's a valid concern. On the other hand, I will say, playing devil's advocate, that even if you have a digital source, when you convert it to analog to actually cut the record, cut the vinyl, uh, there are things you can do to restore analog warmth, which is really what people want. Uh, now, it's, <laughs> ironically, it's less accurate. Uh, digital is extremely accurate, and um, analog is less so. But people like it. So, okay, if people like it, then they should be able to buy it, right? And so 
there are ways to go from digital to analog in such a way that you add back in that je ne sais quoi, that analog warmth, uh, which is actually, believe it or not, a type of distortion. Uh, but it's a good type of distortion. It's a pleasant type of distortion. Um. So uh, I will look into that, though, as because that's a very good question. Um, let's see. Richard DC. I got one more triple driver ear in-ear headphones uh, for about 50 bucks on Amazon Prime Day. Is that a good deal? You bet it is. Wow, that's a great deal. Um, I think the triple drivers, last time I checked, the list price was... Uh, might have been 80 or 100 bucks, something like that. But they are... By bar none, my favorite one more wired headphones, uh, in ear headphones. And that's saying a lot. I did a, uh, on Tech Hive, I did a comparative review of the du dual driver, triple driver, and quad driver one more headphones. And I liked the triple drivers the best. I gave them a five out of five. So you, you got some great, great uh, in ear headphones there they're they're phenomenal they're just so good and 50 bucks geez that's that is a good deal you you did good there bud um let's see uh is it Kamir? do you know about the pantone color system yes indeed i do um pantone colors are a standardized uh set of colors that you can get a chip chart, you know, one of those things that you can fan out and it gives you all these different colors. There's hundreds of them, maybe thousands. Um, what I was talking about earlier was a slightly different, not Pantone, uh, but it's called, um, boy, I just used the word a minute ago and now I'm having a senior moment, uh, Munsell. Uh, they do a similar chip chart, but with shades of gray. And that's what I'm going to be using to paint my room. Um, yes, Archandra. Yeah, those of you who, who know, I've moved to Santa Cruz. My wife and I moved to Santa Cruz, California. We're loving it here. Everybody greets everybody else with another day in paradise. <laughs> so we're, and we agree. It's a wonderful place. And we found a house. We've been renting, but we found a house escrow closes next week Ooh, very exciting now we have some remodeling to do so we're not going to move in right away but uh, we got we got it for a price that will allow us to do that remodeling uh tech dino ideas for for my own av cave yeah well i mentioned that before uh it's uh, painting the entire thing a munsell gray dark munsell gray ideally black uh, but that could get a little disorienting. So I, I'm happy with 9% reflectivity. Um, and uh, that way, the all the attention is on the picture on the screen, which is exactly what I want. Uh, redacted, yep, we did find a new home. We're real happy about it. It's very, it's exactly in the location we want. It's very close to our friends. And that's it. Scott Wilkinson, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, Micah. Have a great time. Thank you so much. All right. See you later. Well, hello, friends, and welcome back to The Tech Guy for Hour 2. I am your host today, Micah Sargent, subbing in for Leo Laporte, uh, who is on a cruise. Um, I am here to answer your tech questions. If you've got them, you send them to 888-827-5536. That's 8888-ASK-LEO and Micah, where you will hopefully get your question answered on the air. Uh, with that, it is time to kick things off uh, with the next round of questions. And our first one comes from, let's go with Thomas in Carlsbad, California. Take my call. There we go. There's Thomas. Sorry about that. Uh, could, you, could you repeat yourself? Excuse me? Are you there? There we are. Okay, I can hear you now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, how are you doing, Thomas? Very good. Thanks for taking my call. Yeah, happy to have you here. So uh, what can I help you with? So I am on the Wink. I am using the Wink Hub. Um, 
and they've had an outage since July 1st. Mm-hmm. I'm, using, I'm using Z-Wave sensors throughout the house. I'm looking for another hub to replace that. And do you have any recommendations? Are you at all familiar with the Wink? Yeah, so I actually, I have a Wink Hub as well. Um, I was a big fan of Wink in the beginning, and I I understand why you uh, have one, because the promise of having this one device, this smart home hub, that had all the different kinds of, basically, languages that these devices use to communicate with one another and with your router. And so the promise of Wink was that it would would be there to provide a way to control all of the devices in your home, be it Z-Wave, Zigbee, Bluetooth, LE, Wi-Fi, all the different things. And so a lot of people hopped on board. Well, then Wink went along and said, you know what? This is just like we were talking about BMW at the start of the show. Uh, Wink realized that they wanted to make money, they needed rather, to make money over time instead of being a device that you could have at the very beginning and you just pay for it once and you're done. And that is where uh, Wink started to charge a subscription service. And then shortly after that, uh, all but stopped working. And as you said, uh, since July, you've not been able to do it. Um, Very familiar with uh, Wink and that system. And this is the problem. There haven't been a whole lot of people to come in and fill that space because uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things where no one is finding uh, a way to be able to do it with uh, financial certainty. And so what you end up having to do is find some sort of device uh, that already offers uh, Z-Wave integration. And there are a few... There are a few third-party devices out there that will do it, but I haven't heard good things about any of them, uh, Thomas. I don't know if you have, uh, have you looked into, you know, are, are there a few brands that you've thought about going after? Because even, you know, I, I was thinking about Amazon's uh, Echo devices that have built-in hubs, but those work with Zigbee. Those don't work with Z-Wave. Z-Wave is one of those technologies that um, that is... Uh, was a was more popular among builders, uh, the folks who create the houses, rather than the folks who then buy afterwards uh, the devices that will actually um, you know go into their home. But yeah, um, I know this is this is probably not the answer that you wanted, uh, but I have not heard of hubs, modern hubs um, that have the technology that you're looking after that. I have heard good things about. That's the big thing. Um, there are some in the maker space, meaning these are little chips that you can install uh, as part of like a Raspberry Pi setup, a little computer setup. Uh, but there aren't a whole lot uh, that I'm seeing that are kind of set and forget that I have heard good things about because Z-Wave is kind of uh, slowly but surely trickling out. It is it is one of the older technologies that's available. Uh, I am seeing a few folks uh, recommend what's called the Homey. This is H-O-M-E-Y, uh, the Homey Pro, and it is a Z-Wave hub. Um, it says it'll, you know, control stuff from your Android device or your iPhone. It has Zigbee, it has Z-Wave, it has Wi-Fi, it has Bluetooth. It also offers infrared connectivity so that you can, you know, control a, a, a fan or a, a other light switch or whatever it might be that, that uses infrared technology. But I got to say, Thomas, my concern for you is that you go with Homey and then Homey closes down. And then what do you do? Well, you're, you're sort of stuck at the, at the start of it again. Yeah, understood. I've been looking at Hubitat, Smart Things, and uh, and nothing seems as simplistic as the um, as the um, Wing Hub. Mm-hmm. And that's that's, right, well, that's we'll, the biggest bummer, right? I mean, that that's what's really upsetting to me. I think one thing that you can uh, that we can kind of hope for is that at the end of this year, we're going to see the introduction of a new take on smart homes with what's called Matter, and Matter is supposed to be the be all end all solution to the the smart home. This thing where finally all of our devices will communicate with one another. And the good thing about it is it's built on protocols that are built into a lot of different devices that we already have. 
And so there is a chance that whatever Z-Wave devices you have in your home will work with Matter through the different, uh, through the different devices that you have, in which case you may be able to sort of move things forward and step outside of having to have that specific hub. Um, but in the meantime, um, I did just see an article from The Verge pop up in our chat room, all included in the show notes at uh, techguylabs.com, where Wink is saying, we may be down, but we're not out just yet. Again, can't really count on that though, right? Because that's what they said before and uh, they still they still ended up not working. I wish I, wish I had a better answer for you there, but uh, it just seems like Z-Wave is is kind of one of the the technologies that I don't see a lot of manufacturers supporting at this time. It's Zigbee, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and Thread, kind of the big protocols, unfortunately. Thank you for your time, Mike. I appreciate the input. Thank you, Thomas, and uh, good luck with that. All right, let's see. Our next call comes from Larry in Manhattan Beach, California. Hello, Larry. Hey, hi. Uh, congratulations on your first day at work. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Larry. I appreciate that. I am, I'm enjoying it so job. far. You're doing a great job. So I'm a recovering uh, Windows user. Oh, congratulations <laughs> on uh, making that change. <laughs> so, well, so I, I, I work for a, a, a company that's a, a tech reseller, and I won a couple of MacBooks, and my old Windows laptop died. And so I'm st- struggling my way through the Apple world. Mm-hmm. I keep getting these messages from iCloud that my iCloud is getting full. And I, I don't know how to do it. I don't really want to use iCloud for storing all my routine stuff. All my documents are in, you know, all, all the documents that I use are mm-hmm. in a Google Drive. Uh, my primary email is uh, a private email provider on Earthlink that I pay for. And um, my all my photos are backed up in Google Photos. And I'm afraid to, I, I don't know how to, how to sort of turn off the syncing to iCloud and get rid of the storage that's there, and I'm afraid it's gonna it's gonna sync back to my device right. and delete everything I have, and and so. Well, okay, <laughs> you're the Mac guy, so this is a really appropriate call for you. Yes, it is, and I will be happy to help you. Uh, we're gonna have to do it off air, but for folks who are out there asking as well, uh, don't worry. We'll include a link in the show notes that has a bunch of information about iCloud and kind of how you can do things that are specific to your Mac. Um, so yes, please stay tuned, Larry. I will help you off the air, uh, but we will take a quick break here, Mike Sergeant in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls after this. Yeah, so I understand your concern. You don't want to uh, turn off iCloud in a certain way that's going to result in you not being able to uh, get your, you know, keep your photos or whatever it happens to be. So the good news is um, the Mac has its own kind of separate settings. And what it sounds like is happening is uh, the Mac is pretty, (laughs) Mac OS itself is pretty forward about trying to make sure that you are uh, syncing all of your stuff and that you are sort of keeping things in the cloud and that you're not keeping them locally, that kind of thing. So there are a few settings um, that the Mac might be using that are causing uh, that issue. And the best, the the quickest thing you can do um, to kind of see what's going on is you click the Apple logo at the top of the screen and you choose about this Mac. And then uh, when that pops up, there are are some tabs up at the top, overview, displays, storage, support, and resources. Under storage, uh, you click on that, and then it's going to take a while to load the storage space that's there on the screen. And when it does, uh, once it does, then it's going to give you some suggestions for ways to manage your storage better. And I'm guessing that macOS is kind of moved you, shifted you into using a lot of those storage uh, saving mechanisms where it will store your iCloud uh, photo library online. It will, here we go. So the recommendations include uh, store in iCloud, which is, yeah, where you, see that. yeah, you store your documents and things like that. You would want that to be turned off as opposed to being turned on, especially since you use Google Drive as your kind of storage solution. Um, 
Optimized storage, that one's uh, a way to kind of remove photos and, I mean, rather videos and TV shows and stuff that are there. That's not one you really need to worry about. In fact, the other two are not the issue. It's that store in iCloud thing that's the big deal where it could be uploading those photos, uh, or rather your files in general, to the cloud. And if it isn't uh, that, then there's also the chance that your photos library is uh, being stored in iCloud. And the thing is, if you didn't have those storage issues before, do you have an iPhone or, or an Android no, phone? No, I don't. So I have an Android phone. Um, I've got a, a Windows PC that I use for work, and I've got an iPad and a MacBook Air and a MacBook Pro. Okay. And on your iPad, have you taken photos on that in the past or video? No. Okay, so yeah, you should not have any issue with this storage space. Uh, the only other thing I can think of is uh, iCloud backups, where your iPad is being uh, backed up to the cloud so that you would be able to oh. re, uh, you know, get, get stuff from there. That's something that you would need to do on your, that you find out on your iPad. Um, in your iPad settings, uh, you launch the settings app, you tap on your name at the top of the settings app, and then you choose. Um, iCloud and from there you will see an option that says iCloud backup and if that is turned on then it's possible <laughs> that that is what's uh, clogging up your storage space but frankly I think that it is a good idea uh, if you don't have uh, an iPad backup anywhere else it is a good idea to be backing up your uh, iPad somewhere so that okay. if you need access to that that you can but that might be what's taking up the storage space there Okay, so I'm looking at. Um, I guess we're running out of time here, but I'm looking at uh, on, on the on the MacBook Air. It's uh, backing up desktops and documents, photos. And ah, I'm not sure where it would get photos from because you don't have any. Yeah, because I only take photos with my uh, Android, and they and they automatically back up to to Google Photos. Yeah, well, uh, I, I gotta I gotta let you go, but I, go to techguylabs.com, and I'll have some support documents that can help walk you through how to cool. turn that off so that you don't okay. have that stay, stay okay. there. Thank you so much, and congratulations again. Thank you so much. You have a good day. You're welcome. Okay, bye. All right, let's take a quick break so I can tell you about our sponsor, Cisco Meraki. I love that name, Cisco Meraki, Cisco Meraki. These are the experts in cloud-based networking for hybrid work. Everybody's doing it, so you might as well make sure you're doing it right. Whether your employees are working from home, they're working at a cabin in the mountains or on a lounge chair at the beach or on an exercise ball in the middle of a studio, a cloud-managed network provides the same exceptional work experience no matter where they are. You may as well roll out the welcome mat because, folks, hybrid work... It's here to stay. Hybrid work works best in the cloud and has its perks for both employees and leaders. Workers can move faster and deliver better results with a cloud-managed network, while leaders can automate distributed operations, build more sustainable workspaces, and proactively protect the network. An IDG Market Pulse research report conducted for Meraki highlights top-tier opportunities in supporting hybrid work. Hybrid work is a priority for 78% of C-suite executives because leaders want to drive collaboration forward while staying on top of boosting productivity and security. Hybrid work also has its challenges. The IDG report raised the red flag about security, noting that 48% of leaders report cybersecurity threats as a primary obstacle to improving workforce experiences. Always on security monitoring is part of what makes the cloud managed network so awesome. And by the way, IT can use apps from Meraki's vast ecosystem of partners. Those are turnkey solutions built to work seamlessly with a Meraki cloud platform for asset tracking, for location analytics, and more. That way, you can gather insights on how people use their workspaces, you can reserve workspaces, and... Ah, we were just talking about this on the tech guy, mobile device management. Integrating devices and systems allow IT to manage, update, and troubleshoot company-owned devices, even when the device and employee are in a remote location. Turn any space into a place of productivity and empower your organization with the same exceptional experience no matter where they work with Meraki and the Cisco suite of technology. Learn how your organization can make hybrid work Work. Visit meraki.cisco.com slash twit. Meraki.cisco.com.
Facebook.com slash twit. Thanks so much to Meraki for sponsoring this week's episode of The Tech Guy. Let's get back to it. Ah, you just, you get me, Professor Laura. Professor Laura just gets me. Music is wonderful. Hey, folks, I am Micah Sargent, and I am in today for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I'm the other tech guy, tech guy too, tech guy also. We've, we've done a bunch of different names. 8888 uh, Ask Leo is the phone number, 888 827 5536, where you call in with your tech questions. Joining us now for a tech question is Gary from Costa Mesa, California. Hello, Gary. Gary, are you there? Oh, I pressed the button. Oh, for some reason, I pressed the button and it didn't take. Now you're there, Gary. Hi, Gary. Oh, you're calling Gary in Costa Mesa? I am calling Gar- now calling Gary in Costa Mesa, California. Hello, okay. Gary. Okay, well, with the delay there, I missed a wish Gary. All right, great. I was just uh, <laughs> telling one angel there that following up with your discussion with Scott about the coaxial speakers, uh-huh. in 1950, my dad bought the latest hi-fi audio equipment available then. And it was a Craftsman, uh, Craftsman radio and, and separate amplifier and a TV. All as a chassis, he was going to build a cabinet around him someday, but never did. Anyhow, that had a university brand speaker that was a coaxial like we were talking about. And I'm pretty sure the range of it was from the lowest possible base to the highest. Wow. Uh, high at that time. So that's 1950. So this one that Scott was talking about, this designer that Scott was talking about is, uh, was maybe not even born then. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Barely. Um, and so that's idea has been around for a long time. And I was telling her too, and I got your address that I think I still have the um, instruction sheets, installation drawings, wiring diagrams, wow. so diagrams and all for those, for that equipment. And I'm just trying to find the best place to, to get rid of it and not throw it away when I die. So uh, I got her address, your address. Oh, good. Well, yeah, we, I, I know that uh, Leo will be a very good steward of, of those uh, documents and probably end up in the, the history cabinet back here. I've offered things to him before, and he says, oh, I'm so full of stuff. I really can't take so much, but I'm sure you'll like this. I was going to say, don't worry. We'll find a bookshelf where it can be on display. Now that you're being his sidekick, then you can scroll it away somewhere. Absolutely. I'm happy to. I'm honored to, in fact. I appreciate that. All right. So I know he's interested in cars, too, so I have a lot of car information to send him as well. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, Gary, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Right now, I don't have any tech questions, but I do listen to you guys all the time, so I come up to date. But to me, all of these things you guys talk about are modern inconveniences, and they're more trouble. (laughs) More trouble than they're worth? I try to not use them. (laughs) I don't. You know what? This is the thing about uh, working in tech for so long is that uh, when you find somebody who says that, it's a very refreshing take. And it's one that I, I have to say, I don't blame you. Because we spend, I mean, I have a job because people struggle with their technology. So clearly yeah. it is such a frustration and that there are so many things that can go wrong. And so I don't blame you for doing your best to avoid it as much as you possibly can until you do end up needing it for whatever it happens to be, in which case yeah, that's why we're here. No, the, yeah, Leo refers to that sometimes as is the nuisance, the trouble, the things that don't work right. And my analysis of why that is is that computer engineers are wonderfully capable at designing things that will do all kinds of unusual, impossible things on the computer. But they're not mechanical engineers and they're not ergonomic engineers. Mm -hmm. It's that they design is hard to use, difficult to hang on to, easy to lose. (laughs) Hard to use and easy to lose. How about that? That, I like that. I'm going to write that down. (laughs) <laughs> Hard to use um, and easy to lose. Yeah. And so they need to get these big companies that are selling these things and treating us customers as guinea pigs. Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. Yeah, that's a big thing where you've got different companies that are uh, basically giving out beta devices, having you purchase devices that are yeah. still in beta and have you use them and tell them how they work or don't work when really that should be something they do before it ever gets yeah. to us. In the old days when us mechanical people design things, we'd try them and build them and build several prototypes and test them and use them ourselves. These guys, I think, don't even use some of these things. They seem so awkward to use. Um, anyhow, that's my complaint. <laughs> I did an error here. So, yes. Uh, look, this is uh, this is a time to air your grievances if you have them. So I appreciate you for taking the time to do that. And I will be on the lookout for your package as well, Gary, to make sure that gets added to the history documents. Thank you so much for calling yeah, in. One, one comment about your f- phone number there. Oh, yeah. Is that you're saying that it's 888-ASK-LEO, but there's one more digit in there. It's 8888-ASK-LEO. Yeah, but I had 88... 88- Five two seven. I had eight 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 five two seven here that I got somewhere, and she didn't know where that came from, and I <laughs> didn't. But then I went to another phone that had numbers in it, and it was eight two seven. But somehow, it's not wasn't clear when you said it twice earlier before I called. Well, I will make sure that we will we do a little pause between the 88s so that uh, folks are aware. Eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. Thank you so much, Gary. We appreciate it. All righty, let's see who is next on the line. We've got uh, Joe from Dalton, Georgia. Hello, Joe. Micah, the blind phone man from Dalton, Georgia. Hi. Glad to have you in this afternoon. <laughs> oh, so good to be here. Thank you. <laughs> hey, I got a weird uh, thing that happened with me in Windows 11, um, but uh, I wanted to see if you'd ever run across this. Uh, I was doing a disk cleanup because I, I like to to uh, make sure that I get all the space because I have a, what is it, a Service Pro 7. It's only got a 128 uh, gig drive, and it it can fill up fast if one's not careful. Okay, okay. Uh, so, but I had a really weird thing. Have you ever, you know how disk cleanup, it says you can free up to this much space. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you know, usually it's a reasonable number. You know, you can free up to 4.3 gigs or something like that because it, when you download a, win, a new Windows installation, it'll offer to let you get rid of the old one, stuff, stuff like that. Well, for some reason, I put an Insider Build ISO on my system, and I ran the thing, and it said, when I ran disk cleanup, it says, you can free up to 818 gigabytes. <laughs> wow. Huh. Uh, and I was, you know, I was like, I, I don't know what this is all about. And it claimed that this, and this is weird. This is an insider build, and it was a, it said previous Windows installation, 818 gigabytes. It was really strange because I don't have that much space. And then I got to thinking, that was suspiciously like the size of my files in OneDrive. Uh huh. Okay. But I went ahead and, you know, I said, well, let me just click on the option and see what happens anyway. So. Nothing appeared to happen, but it was just a very strange thing, and I wonder if you'd ever run across that. So I've got some thoughts, but we do need to take a quick break. Uh, This is the Tech Guy radio show, 8888-ASK-LEO to call, and we will be back with your calls shortly. So it sounds to me like what happened is what had happened was uh, the system because it's so essentially when you created whenever you you know got this ISO and you sort of ran this new bit of of software, it is considering itself its own personal computer if if you can imagine it that it's it's you know it, it's it's now in charge it is the captain now and it looks over to the left and it sees the install that you had before with your windows account logged in with your drive logged in with all that stuff going on and it says ew all that stuff over there that's the that's the old stuff And I can get rid of all of that because now you've got this new system installed. So I think it was getting confused about what it thought was old versus what it thought was new. Because once you, you know, were trying to use this new system, then it looks at everything else that's already been there and says, hey, we can get rid of that because you've wanted to update to the new new instead of have the old old on there as well. 
Yeah, well, I ran the, uh, I mounted the ISO and ran the setup from the ISO, but I said get rid of everything, so oh. it's kind of strange. Uh, you can mount the ISO and then run setup from it, and it does something, and uh, it, it does give you the option of erasing everything, and it seemed to have done that, although it did keep a couple of, uh, it, it did keep one of the third-party drivers on there, but that's not, you know, I actually wanted that, so I was okay with it. But Oh, I was going to say, so I, to confirm, you wanted those to be erased, because if, <laughs> I would have been scared so to hit that have button. even had a previous uh, installation. I see, I see. That's okay. wild, isn't it? That, yeah. Very strange, and honestly, you know, I, I guess with the insider builds, those uh, on the, what is it, the insider track, <laughs> as they used to be called. Now, what are they, the rings or the tracks now? I don't remember, but uh, I know that 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 can sometimes lead to some weirdness. But the fact that it was sort of grabbing from your cloud storage as well, looking at that as well, I think is the most wild part of it. Yeah, that's the only thing. I, I mean, it's suspiciously close to the size of what's in there. That's, anyway, but I've succeeded in blowing Windows 11's mind before anyway, because, I, because I backed up. I, I I was able to use some Linux tools. Uh, I, I wish there was. Uh, I don't know if the win, if Windows has anything similar to Carbon Copy Cloner, but I love those. What is it? Carbon Copy Cloner. And there's one more that's similar to it uh, on the Mac. Uh, uh, now my mind's gone blank. Anyway. Yeah, mine too. Oh, Super Duper. Super Duper, yes. They're, they're, in some ways, they're similar, but uh, I love those utilities uh, when I had a Mac. But anyway, I've used some Linux tools to image the hard drive. Oh, and nice. I imaged, and I imaged it with Windows 10, and then I imaged it with Windows 11. And so I had been running the Windows 10 one for a while, and I said, let me restore my Windows 11 image that I have. It's already set up and everything. Oh, goodness. Uh, the... The, it did not something about my uh, settings, the identification settings or whatever. It was it complained about my uh, uh, authentication settings or something like that, and it kept wanting to look at my face. Then it said, "Oh, here you are." And then it said, "No, I got to look at your face again." Oh, here you are. No, I got to look at your face again. <laughs> oh no! And it, and it was in a funny, weird loop of some sort. And That's I'm odd. guessing that Windows 11, because it was the same device same serial number i guess it maybe it didn't like that that it was all of a sudden it went from 10 to 11 i don't know if that ah, could be could anyway, be I, I've, i'm doing things probably that a lot of people don't think about doing every day so well i'm glad that you're out there testing the system you've we've got to have people you know boots on the ground out there making sure that windows is working it's straight up fly right as uh as my granddad was wont to say <laughs> yeah mm -hmm, yep and, be, and being blind, it kind of adds some wrinkles into things because I'm using speech and stuff like that. And, right. Um, so Windows 11, you know, they've actually added some voices to narrator, those really nice-sounding ones that the that they put on there. Oh, like AI ones? Uh, the Aria, I think, is one of them. Nice. You, you get them in Edge and Office uh, Insider, but uh, they put them in narrator. They'll only work with narrator, but they're kind of neat to listen to. If you want to listen to something for a long time, they sound great. All right. Well, uh, thank you for calling in, and uh, I mm -hmm. hope uh, that gets all ironed out, Joe, but uh, appreciate you joining us. Oh, nothing major, but uh, anyway, I just thought I'd run it by you. Well, you have a good one and doing a great job. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Johnny Jet is here, man. And so is Micah Sargent. Hi, Johnny. Oh. Space Sorry, I there. forgot to pod you up. Gonna... <laughs> there you are. That's all right. I, I, I missed last week. I was flying all day. Yeah, that's right. And so I missed uh, last week's um, segment, and um, but I'm pleasantly surprised. I'm, you've been doing a great job. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. And you're back in your, your home studio. I'm back home after 49 days of traveling. Wow, 49 days. My goodness. Yeah. Are you tired? Are you energized? How are you feeling? I, I was tired. Yeah. <laughs> traveling with two little kids. And, you know, we went to all different places. And we, we got in. We pulled up to the house. And I asked my son what the, his favorite part of the whole trip was. And he was like, coming home. Oh, <laughs> oh. That's a good feeling, right? Yeah, I was happy, but I was surprised. I thought he was going to say some one of the fun parks we went to. But coming home. anyway, <laughs> it's out. You know, it's rough out there trying to travel. Um, you know, it's not like it used to be. Airports are a mess, especially in Canada and Europe, U.S. too, but not as bad. Um, but if there's bad weather, then there's it's going to be bad no matter where you are. So. 
Um, and last week I flew Toronto to Dallas to LA because I have elite status on American. I get free check bags. My wife had to check four bags because she was moving out of her apartment. And um, yeah, I mean, we had no problems. It was smooth travel. So it's really hit or miss. So if you're going out, I really advise people to try and travel midweek, Tuesday, Wednesday, or on a Saturday like we did. And, um, you know, either depending on the airport, show up early. For Toronto, you actually don't want to show up early because oh. that, that's when all the flights are going out, especially to the U.S., and the lines are huge for immigration. That's unless you have global entry or Nexus, which I've talked about before with um, Leo. Nexus is for, it's, it's $50 for five years and includes global entry and TSA pre-check. And what global, global entry does is get you to cut the line for immigration when you arrive back to the U.S. And Nexus is the same thing, but for Canada. So it really saves so much time. Literally, we showed up to the airport two and a half hours early and we were too early because we have, wow. but everyone in your party has to have these, um, these memberships and you have to be approved. You have to you have interviews, which is not easy to get these days. But um, once you do it, I just wrote a post, by the way, I put it in the show notes or the chat room and I'll tweet it out on how to beat the madness at Toronto's Pearson International Airport. And I, those are some of the tips, but also this is the time to try and upgrade or, or use your miles for first class, be, like I did, because you, you know the line to check in is so long, but first class, there's no one there. What do you say to, okay, so I, I wanna, let's, let's talk to someone who's listening, who is, uh, this is, they're finally at a place in their life where they can travel. They haven't been traveling before, but they can travel now. And so they don't have lots of points. They don't have, you know, all that kind of right. stuff. What's, what's advice for new travelers or people who want to kind of become travelers like you, where you spent 49 days somewhere else. Um, what are your tips to those, those folks who maybe don't have the, the veteran experience as it were? Gotcha. Well, first of all, if you are, if you have good credit, get a credit card that gives you rewards as long as you can pay it off in full every month. I mean, there's no questions asked. You have to pay it off. Otherwise do not get an airline or hotel or any kind of travel rewards credit card. Otherwise, cause they charge such a high APR. But if you can, it's a great way to um, subsidize your travel because they give you, you know, usually a huge bonus for signing up. This is in the U.S. Unfortunately, Canada doesn't have these and other parts of the world. The U.S. is golden in terms of th this um, way to redeem points or earn, earn points. You earn more points these days by credit card spend or signing up for them than you do flying, oh, unlike wow. the old days. And also, I mean, if you're trying to find cheap deals, you know, set a fare alert. Way in advance. I already booked my my tickets for Christmas. I did that a month or two ago. So set a fare alert. Find out what those fares are for wherever you're going. And if you don't really care where you're going, then sign up to a newsletter like Scott's Cheap Flights because he finds some incredible deals. He does have a premium version. I think it's forty nine dollars a year, but there's also a free version. And if you see a really good deal, jump on it. And you have twenty four hours to act. If the flight is to or from the U S. or within. The DOT makes it, no matter which airline it is, you have 24 hours, as long as it's seven days or later, to act. So if you if, you know you find a really good deal, you book it, and then you ask your travel companions, hey, can you make it? If they can't, then cancel it within 24 hours, and you're good to go. And uh, American Airlines, by the way, lets you put it on hold for free. You don't need to put a credit card down. The other ones do make you put a credit card down. So keep that in mind. And if you are traveling right now, I talked about it last week or not last week, a couple of weeks ago with Leo, try not to check bags because that's really one of the major problems right now is baggage. You could, I'm sure you've seen the horror photos hmm. from Heathrow, Amsterdam. I mean, Iceland Air is flying baggage handlers in on all their flights to Amsterdam just so their, their customers make sure they get their bags. Heathrow Delta this week flew a plane from Heathrow with no passengers, just a thousand bags to back to Detroit to try and sort it out and get them back wow. to their owners, even though the people weren't it from Detroit. So that's how much of a mess it is right now. So try not to check bags. If you are going to check a bag, drop an air tag in there. Um, they're, you know, they're $29 or $27 and I use mine. Um, and, you know, it, it works. And I, and I know a lot of, I've read a lot of stories where people are like, you know what? The airline says my bag's not here, but I know it is because I can track it. So you just show it to the uh, staff and then go look for it. Do you think, how do, that, how do you think they're feeling about that? Because I've, I've seen that a lot too. Is it 
because I think one of the things that you do really well is that you bring humanity to the folks who work on that side of things. And you've Definitely. done that before where you say, let's not forget that these people are human too. And Definitely. I think that people probably are like, oh, they're on the other side. They're happy to lose the luggage. And so when they see that, that map of where the, but I would like to believe that they go, oh, it actually is here. Now we can find it. Definitely. I think they, I think they're happy for it. You know, you, you no matter what you're in, what business you're in or what you're doing, where, where you're traveling, always be kind. Honestly, mm -hmm. you have to be kind. If you're a jerk, they're not going to do anything for you. But if you're kind, they'll go the extra step. And I, that's why I always bring chocolates on the plane. I bring them for the gate agents, the flight attendants, and myself. And, um, and it really goes a long way because just being polite and nice. But... And, and you know what? I think if you, you know, tell the people nicely, say, by the way, I, I, I dropped an air tag in there and the bag is actually right behind you. Just turn around and they'll be like, OK. <laughs> yeah. Happy to happy to see that. Well, that's yeah. good. That's good. Uh, anything else you want to talk about? How much time we got? Uh, we got two minutes. Oh, good. A little so under two minutes. Yeah. My new favorite travel app I was testing out this week. It's called Flighty. The website's flightyapp.com. It's only for iPhone. But it's five ninety nine a month or forty nine dollars a year. They do give you one tr one test for free. You don't need to put a credit card down, which I really like. But if you're flying and you really want to know all the details, you put in your flight information, and they, it and they will tell you. Wow. They'll tell you when the flight path is loaded. They'll tell you when the gate is assigned. They'll tell you when pushback is, and you can go really details like you know how much the time will be in the air, how much will be on the taxi on either you know departure or arrival. How are they getting this information? It's out there somewhere. Yeah, it's out there, and you know what? They tested it in beta for with over a hundred pilots and crew members for a year and a half. And then COVID hit and then they worked even harder on it. And I, I really love it. it this is, but although it does give you a little bit of anxiety because I was watching, um, you know, I was getting alerts saying that my plane changed from an A319 to a, actually from an A321 to an A319. A321 is much larger with 20 first class seats when an A319 only has eight first class seats. Oh, wow. and, I, but, and I booked first class because I used my miles and points. My, um, months ago i actually paid cheaper than people were paying for coach i paid i paid twenty thousand miles for first class i looked a week before the same seats but in coach were fifty thousand miles first class was not available wow so i thought man they put they changed the plane the aircraft that means i'm going to get bumped because i booked the last two rows and usually if a plane changes equipment and there's not enough first class seats you know the people in row five like we were would be in row five in coach wow. so it kind of it kind of stinks but anyway it turns out that they t switched it back to a A321. Flightyapp.com. Thank you so much, Johnny Jet. We appreciate your time. Thank you. There it is. Ah, yes. Thanks. Yeah. You're doing a great job, man. You must be sweating bullets because <laughs> I would be. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. I, 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 I'm sweating for you, man. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and thank you for telling me about this app because uh, I do a show here on the network called iOS Today where we cover iOS apps. And uh, this oh, is cool. going to be on the next show for sure. This is really cool. Yeah, Flight. I'm glad. Thank you. Check it out. Don't forget to say johnnyjet.com. Oh, you know I will. Don't you worry. <laughs> Don't you worry. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> Thank you, John. All right, buddy. Take care. Good luck. Thanks. Have a good day. See you later. Bye-bye. Okay, let's take a quick break so I can tell you about something we love. It's Cashfly. How do we here know that Cashfly is amazing? Well, because they're bringing you this episode of The Tech Guy, but also because we have been using Cashfly for more than 10 years, and we love them. Deliver your video with Cashfly, the best throughput and global reach, making your content infinitely scalable. See, with Cashfly, you can go live in hours, not days, with sub one second latency. You can ditch your unreliable web RTC solution for Cashfly's WebSocket live video workflow that is scalable to millions of users. You can beat the competition 
because I don't want to wait for content to load. I click on a thing, I want it there. Well, Cashfly's ultra low latency video streaming will help you do that, dramatically increasing your sites and application speed for global audiences. You can reach your audience anywhere in the world, 50 plus locations around the globe. Content's going to be delivered closer to your customers, outperforming local CDNs. You can take a load off of those uh, origin servers and reduce your S3 bills. Look, we're all, any, anyone who works with S3 knows, whew, you open that that uh, envelope and you're going, <laughs> you need to save some money there. Well, reduce bandwidth and increase your cash hit ratio to 100% with Cashfly's storage optimization system and fully managed CDN solutions. With Cashfly's elite managed packages, you will get VIP treatment, 24 seven support and response times in less than an hour. That's practically unheard of. In most cases, they will already know of any issues and will be working to fix them before your team does. Yeah. So if you've got an issue and you go, oh, wow, we were, I was just gonna fix. They're like, no, 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 we've, we got that taken care of. Don't you even worry about it. Very cool managed solutions. So what do you get with Cashfly? Well, you get ultra low latency video streaming that will deliver video to more than a million concurrent users. So if you got that viral video, don't worry. Lightning fast gaming, which will deliver downloads faster with zero lag, glitches or outages. Mobile content optimization that offers automatic and simple image optimization so your site loads faster on any device. And multi-CDN for redundancy and failover, which intelligently balances your traffic across multiple providers, giving you the shortest routes and mitigating against performance glitches. Cashfly, it's 10 times faster than traditional methods, and it's on six continents. One, two, three, four. Yeah, six continents. They are 30% faster than other major CDNs with a 98% cash hit ratio, and they've had 100% availability in the past 12 months. Best of all, Cashfly has 24-7, 365 priority support, so you know they'll always be there for you when you need them. Learn more at cashfly.com. That's cashfly.com. Dot com. Thanks so much to Cashfly for sponsoring this week's episode of The Tech Guy. Let's get back to business. Hello and welcome back. Oh man, I just want to listen to this song, to be honest, to The Tech Guy radio show, the radio show heard round the world. I am your host, Micah Sargent, filling in for Leo Laporte, who is taking a cruise. If you would like to call in and ask a question for uh, the radio show, well, you can by calling 8888-ASK-LEO or 888 888- 8275536. If you're watching me, then you probably see me look off to the right. That's because the number is clearly printed out there. I have not yet memorized it as a uh I am not, I haven't been in this chair for very long, but, uh, or I guess it's not really a chair, it's an exercise ball um, that is quite bouncy. Anyway, uh, this is the place where we answer all of your questions, or in this case, I try to answer all of your questions regarding tech. And uh, we've got a question in from Mike, who is in Rancho Mirage, California. Mike, you are on the air. Hi. Uh, we have a um, Lenovo ThinkPad that runs Windows 10, has um, <clears throat> 8 megabytes of RAM, and it runs painfully slowly. So I'm wondering about adding RAM to it, if that's going to be helpful. Okay, okay. So this is a Windows 10 Lenovo ThinkPad. Um, and you are still running... Okay, Windows 10. Um, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> uh, I would I would need to know a little bit more about uh, the machine that you have. Do you have it with you? Um, yes. Okay, because if we could learn if I could learn what uh, model number it is, which Lenovo ThinkPad you have, uh, that might give me a little bit more information about uh, the E595. E595. Let's take a look at what we've got here. There we go. And, and it runs really slowly. I mean, you have to wait 30 seconds for something to open, and it's really <clears throat> bothersome. Yeah, so um, what I am hearing from the chat, and one of the things that I would suggest is looking at, um, of course, yes, 8 gigabytes of RAM is not a whole lot, and uh, upgrading the RAM might help, but a bigger help would be up 
upgrading the built-in storage. So uh, it is likely that you are running a hard drive inside of that thing, uh, given the age of the ThinkPad. And solid-state storage is going to blow things away. It's going to be a lot faster, especially when you're talking about opening things. If you're having trouble opening files, that is because those little spinning hard drive plates are taking forever to do what they need to do to be able to access the files that you want. With the solid state drive, it's essentially right there, ready for the computer to grab. Um, So I... I almost think that it's a better investment to spend your money on getting a new solid state drive for your ThinkPad uh, that you can then upgrade uh, instead of going RAM. And then if you needed to after that, sure, let's go for a RAM upgrade. But I just, I don't, I don't, I don't think that you're going to be happy getting a RAM upgrade and not a hard drive upgrade because you're still going to have those issues of those files not opening as quickly as you want them to. RAM, most of the time, uh, when it's when you see those changes is when you are doing uh, different tasks on your computer and you are you know, working in Photoshop or a photo Im- image uh, application and you are hoping for it to move a little bit faster, that kind of thing. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, not as, it's not as much tied to how quickly a file opens or how quickly even the operating system itself, you know, Windows is kind of going between different tasks. That is often tied to the uh, hard drive, and yes, uh, as somebody's okay, pointing, so this is go ahead. this is something that uh, is user changeable as easily as the uh, RAM cards. I, I hope so. Not as easy to change, but what I will do for you um, is I will include Mike. Sorry, I was, <laughs> couldn't remember if it's Mike or Joe. Mike um, is I will include a link in the show notes to some guides on upgrading the hard drive. Uh, that is at techguylabs.com uh, mm-hmm. that will get you to the episode page for this uh, episode and this is 1911 and that way you can uh, learn how complicated it is it's just a little bit more complicated because essentially what you have to do is set the new hard drive kind of outside of the machine first and do an install, and then you're going to need to take the hard drive out of the inside and then put the solid state drive in. So there's just a little bit more than just kind of turning it off, unscrewing it, popping in some new RAM and moving on, if that makes sense. Right. Okay. Uh, so two other questions. If, if one does decide to upgrade RAM, do you have to be symmetrical in the two slots, or can you have, um, you know, a... That- um, an eight in one and a four in the other, say, for instance. I see what you're saying. So you, if you just wanted to kind of go instead of uh, four, if you, if you had two fours in there right now and you were trying to go to eight uh, versus going four and one and just buying an eight uh, into that. I honestly don't know on a Lenovo, I will be honest with you. Um, there, in, in almost every case, symmetrical RAM is kind of the, the way to go. And I really don't know on a ThinkPad. That is a good question. All right. And finally, could McAfee have something to do with this? You know, <laughs> Mike, McAfee has something to do with everything. Uh, no, th- this is the thing. There's a chance, right? There's a chance that it is playing a small role in uh, causing some slowdown in your computer because it's doing scans. It's uh, checking for files and, and checking to see if any of those files have viruses, that kind of thing. It's essentially always running in the background. And so in that case, yes. And I will uh, parrot Leo Laporte in saying that for most people, in most cases, they don't need to have a third-party virus software because Windows has a first-party virus software that will do a fine job of keeping you protected online. Um, a lot of times, those third-party uh, applications like McAfee are just bloatware. And I have to tell you, Mike, as you said that, I've never seen the chat room light up so quickly with so many messages of everyone saying, remove McAfee, uninstall McAfee, get rid of McAfee, kick McAfee, delete Mac. So... Everyone in the chat room who uses Windows regularly is also saying that you should probably uninstall McAfee and start there and just use Windows Defender. Um, and then after that, 
I think the solid state drive is going to be a really good investment for you. Keep that machine going a little bit longer. And RAM, last but not least. And uh, yeah, I, as, as far as I can see, there's there's... It's very rare that anyone is, uh, you know, putting one size of RAM in one side and a different size of RAM in the other. Okay, great. Well, appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for calling in. We appreciate it. Okay, thanks. All right. Our next call comes from Daryl in Saratoga, New York. Hello. Hi, Micah. Hi, and am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, you are. And I just want to say you're a great, great addition to the show. I love the balance of the iOS, and we love watching you dance. So it's like our favorite thing is to watch you move and add a, a nice human spirit to the show. A great compliment and a great balance. Thank you. You're going to make me cry on air. Let's not do this. <laughs> That's very sweet of you. Thank you. We're fast fans. So um, I'm... Over the years, I have been doing some writing, uh, mostly in Windows um, Docs and with inserts of uh, PNG. Mm -hmm. And I want to put these together in a simple format to use an ebook. Yeah. And I understand this. There are certain formats for ebooks that are going to be acceptable to put out into the world for sale. So if, if you could resource some. Um, easy format for me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, but don't worry. You stay on the line. I will have some answers for you. Leo Laporte's The Tech Guy, Micah Sargent, subbing in. That snuck up on us. Um, yeah, so... Of course, yes, there are lots of different file uh, types. Um, Amazon has its own called AZW, uh, which is going to be kind of the the one that is locked into Amazon. And if, in fact, I think if you want to publish to the Kindle uh, store, you will have to use that format or translate it into that format. But the one that you should be using is called dot. E-P-U-B, that's EPUB, EPUB format. EPUB is a, uh, is, is a far more open type of uh, document, uh, or excuse me, iBook uh, form that is going to be able to be used across lots of different publishing platforms. And the cool thing about EPUB is that it is translatable into all the other kinds of formats. So with EPUB, you get uh, the ability to easily translate into .mobi and .azw or azw3, which is Amazon's, uh, those are the Amazon's two versions. Um, so I think that your best bet is to do EPUB and then everyone in the chat room is going, and please also make a PDF version because that is what a lot of folks will do is if there's somebody out there who doesn't have a, a book reading format, uh, a, a software that can you know do a book reading format, it's nice to have a PDF as a, a sort of back, uh, an option to use instead in, in place. That's great. Great foundation for you. And I really appreciate it. I've been searching a lot of places for what is the most popular and best. And, that, and that's a really great reply. I want to thank you very much. Carry on. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate you calling in and thank you for watching. And also thank you for the compliments on the dance moves. I appreciate it. <laughs> no worries. Take care now. Bye-bye. Uh, all right. Uh, couldn't remember. Oh, yeah. This is the top of the hour break, isn't it? Wow, we were right. The time does just fly by. My God. Yeah, I I'm really curious about that. Honestly, um, publishing. I think it's such a cool idea. Uh, thank you, Mike B. That's very sweet. Um, but yes, EPUB uh, is definitely the format for most cases. And in fact, I think, let me see. I think Pages, oh, thank you, Kim. Um, I think Pages will, how does Leo do this? How does he get to, I guess he's using that computer so he could just use the keyboard down here. Because um, I feel like I have to move this. Uh, can we oil this before next Saturday? Uh, John, or whatever, grease it, oil it, because 
it's squeakier than, um, yeah. I'm just going to keep doing this. If anyone needs some free Foley for, never mind. Um, let me start a new document here. Now I'm kind of curious about uh, doing a book. Yeah, so of course Pages uh, has a built-in, oh, I might even, Pages might be installed by default and then I can show everybody on the screen. Yeah, it, it does. Okay, so yeah, if we want to show people, um, I'll choose books and we'll go with this book called A Contemporary Novel. Hopefully our friend uh, is still out there watching. And then let me just make this full screen here. What's our book going to be called? The Waking Tech Guy. Why is it making me... There we go. Not by Ernest Ampere, but instead by... I didn't realize I had caps lock on. Micah Sargent. All right, so here's our book. And when we export, you can see there's export to EPUB as one of the options right here. A PDF, of course, is included, but watch as we go into the EPUB and see. Obviously, we want to call this the waking tech guy. And the, use the first page as the cover of the book and then layout, so reflowable layout, EPUB file with content that reflows based on device and orientation. So it's uh, really good for doing um, a whole bunch of different sizes versus fixed. Uh, so this is if you are doing uh, illustrations, especially if you have a super illustrated book, you obviously don't want it um, kind of trying to redo things. Or if you know that the format of the book is very important and uh, it's it's not just kind of text and stuff like that, then you might want to fix layout, uh, including advanced options for where this book might be. Uh, in this case, mm, I think this would be business and personal finance. No, there we go. Professional and technical. I like that one more. Uh, English, of course, is the language. Table of contents and embed the fonts. We'll do that. And then we'll call it the waking tech guy. And we'll store it on the desktop. Export that there. And now when we go back, oh, and also there's an option right here to publish directly to Apple Books. So that's one way to make it kind of happen fast if you wanted to. I'll delete that. Now, I bet if I right click and choose open with, yes, it's going to open it with books instead of pages. And then we'll get out of that. And now there's the waking tech guy and all 10 pages of my book. Oh, would anyone like to hear me read Latin for the next 30 minutes? Etiam sit amet est donec. You know, one thing that's kind of interesting is that um, V in Latin is pronounced W. It's pronounced like it's a W. And so there's that very popular uh, Vini, Vidi, Viki that people know of. I came, I saw, I conquered. And what people don't know is that it's actually pronounced weenie, weedy, weeky, instead of vinny, vidi, viki. Yes. And so I remember my Latin teacher in high school. Um, she was amazing. And one of the things that she would do is she would really get into pronunciation. So she would just like take her whole body and she'd be like, the, it's pronounced wuh. Whoa, like that. And so whenever she taught us that, she's like, it's winny, witty, weaky. And yeah, I'll never forget uh, her her teachings. Those were that was just one of, of many. Um, I came, I saw, I conquered. Uh, very she was amazing. She was such a good teacher. And uh, she she taught us um, uh, Christmas carols, uh Teniunt, teniunt, tintin nabula, nuat et delectat nos wigahita trahea. And that is um, jingle bells. Teniunt, teniunt means ring the bell. Uh, tintin nabula is, I think the bell is ringing. Um, nuat et delectat nos wigahita trahea is uh, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. 
oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh. Um, as well as several others, there were <laughs> we we sang songs, we uh, wrote stories, we did all sorts of stuff, and you could not tell that woman that uh, Latin was a dead language because then she would again proceed to contort her body as she explained that Latin is never dead because it is alive in so many languages. It exists as the foundation of so many languages. So, uh, yeah, I will never forget um, Ms. Briggs, Mrs. Briggs, I should say. Uh, she was awesome. Uh, I should say she is awesome. I, as far as I know, she is, she's no longer a Latin teacher because she retired, I should say Latin teacher, as she retired um, my junior year of high school. But she was just amazing. And it's true that Latin is alive in the languages that we have today. Uh, I, you see so much of it, and I'm so thankful for having that class because, or those classes, because I get like the roots of words sometimes, I can figure out what the rest of it means because of my basis in Latin. Uh, they did never, they didn't put her in the brig. I will tell you, her favorite thing was, um, uh, diet Dr. Pepper. And so whenever she retired, each of us, each of her students brought her a case of DDP, as she called it. And so there was a case of Diet Dr. Pepper stacked to the ceiling of the classroom for her. Hello, friends. How are you today? Yes, that is my tagline. Hello, friends. Uh, Leo Laporte says, hey, 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 how are you today? I, Micah Sargent, say, hello, friends. How are you today? I am Micah Sargent, tech guy also, subbing in today for Leo Laporte and next week on Saturday because Leo is on a cruise with his drones and his a hundred of his closest friends. Uh, but don't worry because I am here with you and am excited to take your questions and uh, hopefully answer them too, not just take them. If you have questions, well, I've got a number for you. 8888-ASK-LEO, also 888-827-5536. Calling that number in the U.S. is toll free. Outside of the U.S., you'll want to use something like Skype to call. But when you do, you'll get through, in theory, to talk to me and I will talk to you. There's some rhyming that's going on in there. Uh, <laughs> thank you for joining us here on The Tech Guy. I am having lots of fun here filling in for Leo Laporte and, um, you know, doing doing voices from time to time, doing accents, that kind of thing. Uh, let's see who's out there asking for questions, asking for answers to questions, not asking for questions. I'm the one asking for questions. Uh, we got, uh, let's see, we got uh, Rick from Glendale, California, who we're going to bring on the line right now. Glenn, or Rick, you're on the air. Thank you, Michael. Hello, friend. I've got uh, one, and if you had time, two very short phone questions. My first one is I've got a Google Pixel 4a, and I have concluded that it does not like one of my friends. <gasps> oh, and the, no. reason, the reason for that is I've assigned a couple of close friends custom ringtones, so when they call, I know it's them. And uh, it worked for uh, quite a while with this one friend, and then suddenly it refused to use the custom ringtone I assigned. It started to play random things. I'm glad it makes noise, so I know he's calling, <laughs> but it like would play the first line from a podcast, and each week always the same podcast. So let me tell you what I've done to try and troubleshoot this. Uh -huh. I went through my phone, I found that podcast, I deleted it, so that wasn't it. I reassigned my uh, that friend a different ringtone. Uh, that made no difference. I deleted the contact contact for my friend and reinstalled him as it were with a change so instead of mr john smith i put him in as dr john smith it still will not play the custom ringtone and like i said i've tried a different couple of songs on it it doesn't like him have you ever seen anything like that before um so i have not seen anything like that but what i'm wondering is if there is a google contacts backup situation that's happening here where your so your google contacts are of course stored as part of your google account right and at right. some point you went in and you set dr john who was mr john um as this contact with that specific audio and and what have you and i'm wondering if there isn't somewhere a uh an online version of this where mr john still exists with that other number maybe it's 888-827-5536 and so when that number calls 
it's still pulling information from that old contact that you had before that has that custom ringtone tied to it. I know you said you created a new one, uh, but I'm wondering if there is uh, still a version of that somewhere. What I would suggest doing is, of course, writing down all of the information that you have about Dr. John, and that way you have it physically. And then deleting both versions of Dr. John, uh, the, the old one if it's still there, and the new one that's there now. And then restarting your phone and looking then again into your contacts app and seeing if magically any version of Dr. John pops up. And if it does pop up, then you know that somewhere there's just this annoying uh, sort of hitch in the system that is keeping your contact stored online. And then what I would do from there is log into your Google account uh, on a computer somewhere, uh, go to contacts.google.com and look for Dr. John or Mr. John or whomever and uh, remove it there see if it's gone. Um, that way, if it's, you know, again, if it's, if it's a backup situation that's kind of keeping the ghost of Dr. John in your system, that could be what's going on. But um, any other thoughts? Because I know you said you did some troubleshooting uh, with that, and I want to make sure we're, we're covering all those bases. No, no, I have not tried that at all as far as maybe a backup contact list. And honestly, uh, ignorance on my part, I haven't really even tried restarting the phone, which, you know, I'm a Windows guy and I should have started with that. But hey, I'll, I'll try that. we don't blame ourselves for not thinking of everything. That's why you're calling. I'm happy to help. So don't worry about that. Uh, you know what? I, I say this to everybody. Uh, there's no reason to, you know, put oneself down over uh, tech troubles because... It, it, put all that put all that negativity on the tech and tell the tech it needs to do better. That's how I feel. Uh, what's your other I, question? I, I, I had a second really quick question. Does anybody out there rate and review cell phones for their ability to be used as a phone? Okay. <laughs> I know we're all using them as computers, which is great. My, my Pixel 4a actually works fine as a computer, but it's really lousy as far as phone calls, even to the point where I thought, man, do I want to pay to put a landline back in? And again, cost is not an issue. I am an Android guy, but I've actually toyed with the idea of buying like, you know, an iPhone uh, uh, thir uh, uh, you know, 13 Max or whatever, just to get something that would work as a phone. Does anybody review phones for their quality as a telephone? I am blown away because I thought, okay, surely somebody out there would. And so I went to try to do some Google Foo and I'm thinking, what do I actually type in here? The best phone phone, the best phone smartphone, the best phone for phoning, <laughs> the best call phone. That's actually kind of a hard thing to search for. Um, and it is a good question because different phones have different microphones inside of them and different technology that is actually looking at the uh, audio that's coming in to the microphone and trying to sort between the voice versus uh, what's background noise. And then also uh, some different phones are doing some magic to try and handle the compression that takes place whenever you place a call. Uh, so that can be kind of uh, difficult. Now, Mike B in the chat does have a, uh, a link from Smartphones Revealed. This looks like one of those sites that is uh, just there to get uh, clicks from Google. Um, it has uh, top 30 phones with the best call quality. But again, mm. it's it's then just a list of, of phones. It doesn't really have more information about it. So I don't I don't know uh, quite about that. I would you know what? Maybe this is my next venture. <laughs> You've given me such a good idea here because yeah, some people still do use uh, phones for placing calls. Oh, and uh, here we go. We got a better much better link. Um, the way that you have to do it is by putting on a suit and tie and doing a search for the best business smartphones. If you do that, then it shows you some stuff for uh, handsets for work and productivity. And we've got one um, from uh, Tech Radar. And uh, one of the options talks about a few of the phones. So we'll include a link to that in the show notes. That's uh, techguylabs.com. And uh, it seems like it, there's at least one person out there, uh, Rick, that is looking at phones for their phone quality. 
Hey, thank you, Micah, and a big thank you to Leo also for, I don't know how many months it's been now, but putting the full transcripts of the show, that is hugely helpful. Isn't it go great? back if I miss something and uh, to be able to find it. So just whoever's responsible for that, I want to say a big thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that's our social media team and uh, also Lisa, who, uh, Lisa Laporte, who made that possible. So yes, I'm so glad those are there too uh, for accessibility reasons, first and foremost. And secondly, yeah, it's very easy to, to find things as you need them. So so, Rick, thank you for calling in. Thank you for your kind words. And uh, I hope you find the phone you want with the best call quality available. We appreciate it. Thanks so much, Micah. Thanks. All right. Well, we don't have much time left before we're going to take another break. So uh, I guess I'll just say, well, it's almost. Okay, yeah, I can say 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number you call to get in touch with me. Have a, have a question and an answer. Bye. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean that's why I just pressing. I was like, ah, I'm I have to. I have to admit, I didn't know that you were in control. I didn't. I didn't know that you were in control of making those sounds happen. I just thought they automatically happened. So you've been like doing it as I'm saying goodbye, and I'm going. This is amazing. Oh, it's fading out, I think. I think they're making me come in. But I don't want to. It's like a heat wave, baby. Can I say baby on the radio? <laughs> anyway, I am Micah Sargent, uh, tech guy also, subbing in today for Leo Laporte, uh, who is on a cruise. If you have tech questions, I will try to have tech answers. You call 8888-ASK-LEO. That's 888 888- 827-5536. That's the phone number you call uh, to get your question on the radio, as it were. And uh, hopefully, I'll be able to answer it for you. Uh, let us go to the phones with Max from Lake Worth, Florida. Lake Worth, Florida. Hello, Max. Hello, Captain Micah. Hello, hello. How are you? I just promoted you to the captain rank because you're doing such an outstanding job. Oh, thank you so much, Max. I recognize your voice. I, if I remember correctly, you yeah, you are always a hoot when you come on to the show. <laughs> well, I'm sure you're not missing too much about Leo. He's having a great time. Yes, I've I've seen so many photos. He seems to be enjoying himself for sure. Well, well, he deserves a vacation anyway. Indeed, I agree. I'm glad he's taking a break. Well, I'm very glad that you are there for us, and I've been really enjoying uh, your program today. I think you should also do it on Sundays, too. I don't know why you don't want to do it on Sunday. <laughs> it's, well. well, you know how you said Leo needs a vacation? I also have to have some days off during the week, because otherwise oh, I would get burnt oh, okay. out. So. But, but, but you're a young stub. You don't need that much vacation. <laughs> you're right. I, Man, come on. An hour of sleep a night, that's all I really need to, to keep going. That's, that is correct. So uh, let me get to the question I have. Reason, I have a XPS, uh, Dell XPS uh, machine, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And recently, I keep getting this uh, video DX uh, driver exception errors. Mm. And there was no problem before. I've been having it for like a four years. I'm going to get a new laptop anyway. Okay. But all of a sudden, I'm getting these uh, driver uh, kernel exception for the DX, the Direct X. Microsoft DirectX system. And I had to keep repairing the damn thing and it keeps coming back. So I don't know whether there is some sort of an inherent problem because it seems to be happening after the last update that I, I did. Yeah, I'm seeing I that. Just, uh, so I'm ready to throw this away because I'm a little tired of keep going through all the steps, right? Make sure all the drivers are up to date and this and that and end up repairing the uh, the you know the DirectX um, drivers. Mm-hmm. So, uh, do you know anything about this? Have you heard about this issue coming up with the 
you read those updates? I'm just curious. Yeah, so I'm actually seeing a lot of people talking about this uh, this yeah, problem with know, DirectX. Okay, so, yeah. You're not alone so, for I'm sure. Fine. Yeah, all of a sudden happening. It never happened to me before, four years. Not all of a sudden happening. So, yeah, it sounds like uh, it what, is... What's your assessment? My... What's my, your my, assessment? my Initial assessment here is that this is uh, absolutely tied to an update at some point. That you have uh, some sort of issue that has cropped up after you've you know done an update or an install. Yeah. Um, but the problem that I'm seeing here is there are lots of people complaining about this issue, but there aren't a whole yeah. lot of people who have provided a response, an answer to this issue. And it's well, yeah, I mean, it seems like uh, what what needs to happen here is. Uh, Another Patch Tuesday with another update yeah. that solves for the problem. Yeah. I have one bit of advice that I can give you um, that may or may not work, but it is worth uh, looking into. Uh, there is an application I use on my Mac uh, by okay. MacPaw. Uh, that's M A C P A W dot com. And you're probably going, why is he talking about uh, software on a Mac? Well, <laughs> don't worry. I'm sure you have a point here. Yeah. yeah um, point here. MacPaw creates an application called Clean My PC. And this software can be used to do some kind of maintenance tasks and some kind of uh, behind-the-scenes registry cleanup and some adjustments and uh, concerns there uh, that will be able to kind of sort of tidy things up, if that makes sense. Um, there okay, is well, uh, that's great, but uh, I can't write it down, so will you be kind enough to put in the... Uh, the, the show notes? Yes, it will absolutely be in the show notes at uh, techguylabs.com. It will have the link directly to Clean My PC. And yeah, I'm just wondering, I, I think you should give that a download and uh, just give that a run and see how that works I for will. you. I will, because the, uh, the causes are multiple multitudes. For yes. For example, outdated uh, graphic drivers, which are already uh, installed and reinstalled. The hardware errors, uh, possibly some hardware failure, which are around all these utilities that Microsoft provides to check for the hardware. Then you do file integrity checks. Everything passes, and then then I end up with this corrupted, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the, the DriveX, the Microsoft uh, uh, X system. So. But anyway, I'll definitely give uh, your suggestion a try, a download, and see what happens. Thanks very much for, for that information. Yeah, absolutely. Quick uh, run about traveling because you were talking to Johnny Jet, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I just, uh, so I just uh, got back from Canada. I went from Palm Beach to Montreal, to through New Jersey and to, uh, to Montreal, and then back. So let me just briefly give you my experience. As John, Johnny, and Leo emphasized, download the airline's app. I'm a part of the uh, United uh, Mileage Plus, so I get a lot of miles on it, and I travel uh, business class most of the time. So that app that United has pretty much takes care of everything for you, including scanning your passport, the COVID uh, vaccination card, collecting seats, and all that all the way. So definitely take advantage of that. Do everything you can so you're travel ready. So when you go to the airport, you are done, baby. You just you know uh, checking your luggage. I do have luggage I check, uh -huh. and then you're out, out, you know, you're you're to the you're you're going to uh, security and on the plane and all that. Yeah. Now, the funny thing is this. I know Johnny keeps saying, "Do not check luggage." Do you know what's happening right now with that advice? What's that? My plane got delayed every time because we have these people coming in with these so-called carry-on luggage, right? And it's not carry-on. It's carry -on too luggage. big to fit, and so it takes yeah, forever I mean, to load on the plane. Push it, yeah, push it on the, uh, you know, over, overhead in a compartment, you won't fit, and there's a fight happens because people stop getting moved around, and all of a sudden the plane, planes get delayed. So I understand people don't want to check in their luggage. Mm -hmm. but you have to be reasonable here. 
I am right there with you. I think... Uh, and it's getting really frustrating because my freaking plane uh, delays every time because of all these... Yeah, even I'm traveling business class, right? Right. So you're bringing this huge uh, uh, so-called uh, luggage. Max, I got to let you go, pal. I, I got to let you go, but I do appreciate uh, you taking the time. I appreciate uh, you sharing your opinions right. there on luggage, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Mike is subbing in. Ah, Max is always a talker. We uh, we appreciate his energy on the tech guy. Um, there are times when I will be doing some stuff on Sundays and I happen to turn on the live stream and Max has called in and uh, there's always a quote or two worth, uh, worth sharing. I was on Bill Handle, Chumley, uh, a couple of uh, Tuesdays ago. I was on Bill Handle um, talking about all sorts of stuff. Uh, electric cars. No, no. Hydrogen cars. <laughs> Thank you, Sushi Dub. <laughs> it's time for the Tech Guy, the radio show heard around the world. I am your host today, Micah Sargent, subbing in for Leo Laporte. If you have tech questions, I have tech answers. 88 88- 88 ask leo is the number you call 888-827-5536. Dicky D Disco Dick D Bartolo is up next, but uh before we get there, we will take a call or two. Uh let's see who's coming up next. Uh it's James from Dallas, Texas. Hello James. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing well today, James. How are you? I'm 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 good. You're doing well for uh, subbing for Leo, so uh, I'll just give you some cred there. It's nice to talk to you. Thanks so much. So, it's good to talk to you too. My my question, I I volunteered, uh, made, and I hope I didn't bit off, bite off more than I could chew. But my my buddy, this friend, runs a university out of Africa, mm-hmm. and he has bought their staff. 30 iPads okay. so, so they can go around and do whatever. And he bought them in the U.S. And he asked me if I would set them up. I'm like, yeah, sure. At first, I didn't even realize it was 30 iPads. I thought it was like five, which would have been maybe <laughs> still. He asked for 30 iPads, which is no big deal. Uh, you know, and I, yeah, I'll probably just do like a one database or one, and I could back them up and, and set them all up. Really straightforward. Yeah. But then he told me. Well, James, I need I need them locked down so they can't watch movies and they can't do this and they can't do that. I'm like, uh, okay. And I'm thinking, okay, I've only done like the family share, and like my my work, we use like the MDM to yeah. manage the thing. So I'm wondering, for 30 iPads, should I use like family share, which would then require multiple mm-hmm. like the Apple ID? Yeah, no. Or should Go yeah. down a path of an MDM, which I have zero experience with. I've got it. I've got. I've got your answer for you right down the center okay. of that. Yeah. So there's a solution okay. for you that is. It is um, MDM for people who are listening. Going, what is he talking about there? Mobile device management. Um, and a lot of right. times, these are third party apps that uh, third party apps and services that will help you manage your devices. But what's awesome is Apple has solved this problem for us with a tool called Apple Configurator, and it okay. is a really handy tool that I actually use um, for my devices at times where if there are things that I want, because I, because of the nature of my job, I get new devices all the time and I want to have them set up right. exactly the same way. And what Apple Configurator lets you do is essentially create like a profile of exactly okay. how you want the system to be set up. And then you can make that possible for every single one of those devices. So what you'll end up doing is plugging in each iPad, setting it up with Apple Configurator. And Apple Configurator has all the options for, I don't want them to be able to access this 
this. I don't want them to be able to do this. I want to make sure that uh, software updates get installed automatically, that this has a passcode, that it already has the network Wi-Fi. I mean, it does everything. And of course, uh, as per usual, I will include links in the show notes, techguylabs.com, to the Apple Configurator page that has all the information you need. It's a free app to download um, on your Mac and also on the iPhone. Um, that is for doing uh, Mac management specifically. So that one is probably not necessary, but uh, Apple Configurator for the Mac is what you can use to be able to okay. make those adjustments on there. Yeah. I've used I've used Apple Configurator once before when before my real job my day job uh, before they use an MDM you they would send you the profile and you would have to load it using the configurator so I've used that before um, so it, yeah okay. it gets pretty powerful yeah it is um, okay but but since it's just Apple directly what's nice about that is that then you aren't having to worry about a third party platform to to do all of that mobile device management right so there's a car. Yeah, and there's a cost associated with it. If I just did it, like, I think it's JNF or something like that, you know, they want a couple bucks a month per device. And being a nonprofit ministry, it's like we don't have an unlimited budget just to spend $1,000 a year or plus exactly. that to manage devices like that. And being remote as well, because my, my friend doesn't live in Africa. He lives in Dallas with me. or And, and so, you know, it, that remote is also the... The, the kicker there. So with, with using Apple Configurator, can the, the, the ministers, the people that are using these iPads, can they still use their Apple ID, their own Apple ID, or do we need to use the same Apple ID, which is against Apple's terms and conditions? No, there, found out. that's the magic of this, is that there are options for both. So the, like, okay. there are options for everything could be done by the terms and conditions, but that it'll still allow, because th essentially this is what small businesses are using to make this happen. So when they give somebody the, the phone or the Mac or the iPad or whatever it happens to be, they still are logging in with their own stuff. Um, it's just that the profile that is sort of behind the scenes is saying you can't do this or you can do that. So yeah, it's okay. uh, it's all built in. Apple Configurator, again, super magical. And also, I it's an app that I recommend everybody everybody download anyway because it can help you troubleshoot some problems with just your device if you have them. I've been able to use it before to do some restores. Yeah, you know what? That's, maybe that's what I had to use it for was to, to, to do a restore on an old iPad or something. But I have used it before, so I am somewhat familiar in my uh, Mac uh, environment that I now have. So, yeah. So, uh, okay, yeah, no, that's great. That's, uh, I, you, know, I, you know, the research I've done, everything, there was a, an MDM cost money. And as I was trying exactly. to, exactly. You know, this is about you know. This sounds like uh, people trying to help people, and oftentimes when exactly. you're trying to help people, you don't have a lot of money in the first place, unfortunately. Exactly, exactly. They got the thirty pads. I think a donor stepped up and donated the the money to buy thirty iPads, and uh, I volunteered my time. In fact, I get to the luxury to take. I'm taking them to Africa oh, in, wow. uh, in October. Yes, and uh, I get to train them on how to use. These, we got Microsoft, believe it or not, is really has a really good nonprofit uh, license uh, program, mm -hmm. and so uh, he got licenses uh, at no cost. Uh, so we're going to use Teams instead of like Zoom and and whatnot. Uh, teams and SharePoint, so they can share files and, and do uh, Teams calls and, and chat, and then also you know the Teams phone calls. And it, it's this just going to be a, a wonderful and a wonderful environment. So. That's amazing, James. I want you to reach out to me. My first name M I K A H at twit TV, um, and okay. uh, let me know if you if you run into issues. I mean, if you have any trouble with this, okay. uh, let me know. I'd like to to help out with that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. I've listened to Leo for years, and this is the first time I've called. Cause I, when I started the research, I was like, you know what? I think to Micah would know, because he's the iOS guy. I am. I am. Well, I am honored that uh, this is the time when you chose to call in, and I think it's amazing what you and your friend are doing. And, yeah, if you need any help with uh, Apple Configurator or anything like that, reach out to me there where we've got more time yeah. than we do here. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. You as well. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't think we've got enough time for any more calls today. Uh, I still have a minute. But I do have a minute left, which is fine. Uh, oh, okay. Well, we'll give it a try. Frank calling in from Camarillo, California. Hello, Frank. Hello. 
Hi there. Yeah. How can I help? Well, I reset something in my computer. Okay. So that I do not, um, my browsers will not work. Oh, okay. What do you mean when you say your browsers will not work? You you type in a website and when you hit enter, it says, I can't go to that website. website. Yeah. Well, let's see. So I've got a tab and it says uh, Microsoft Edge not responding. Oh, not responding. Okay. Well, let's see. Yeah, not responding. And uh, is that the only browser that you have on your computer is Microsoft Edge? Currently, yes. Okay. Um, well, Frank, we are going to take a break on air, but I'm still going to help you out. So just stay okay. on the line. Uh, Micah Sargent subbing in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. All right. So, Frank, um, let's let's go down to, well, what version of Windows do you have on, do you know if you have Windows 10 or Windows 11? Uh, 10. Okay. Um, let's see about uh, opening up Microsoft Edge again, uh, kind of fresh start. Um, so, if you find when, or if you find Microsoft Edge in your your uh, taskbar at the bottom of the screen is where yours is, I believe. Um, then there's an option to close all windows, and basically, what we're going to try to do here is kind of start fresh with a new window. And okay. well, uh, I'm going to go to the to the uh, type type here for search to search. Um, no, no. So what we want to do is go down all the way to the bottom of the screen where you, do you have different icons on the bottom of your screen? I do. I have, I have, uh, yes, edges there. Okay. So right click on edge and tell me what pops up whenever you right click on it. Uh, new window, uh, new in private window, Microsoft edge or unplug. Okay. Yeah, so close is what you want to do. Now, I, I do want to clarify because someone in the chat is saying um, that you said that you've tried different browsers and none of them are working. Is that true? I believe that is the case. Correct. Okay, okay. That was a clarification that I missed. So, hmm, then this does sound like a bigger thing uh, than just that. Um, one, someone, John, how come you were saying DNS? How did you know it was DNS? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Yeah. So, do you have other apps on your Windows machine um, outside of Google Chrome? An example would be like Netflix or Hulu or one of those other apps that you yeah. may have downloaded from the this, Windows Store. This, yeah, this this computer has probably uh, does not have anything on it at all. It's a fairly new computer. So, okay. So uh, I say, when I say fairly new, I mean. Uh, fairly recently um, refreshed. Got it. Got it. So you don't have much on it at all and it's still not working. No. Um, no. So. What about, okay, so one other thing we can do, um, hit the Windows key on your keyboard and you should see a search field pop up automatically. Yeah. Um, type in network. So can I, okay. I see where you're going. Uh huh. We're going to go into the the network settings. Uh, and are, do you know if you are are Ethernet or Wi-Fi connected? Uh, I am on this one, on this one Wi-Fi. Okay. Um, and then I'm just curious what your settings say for Wi-Fi in uh, in in the settings menu. What okay, if there's I go any? To, um, you mean network status? Uh, yeah, exactly. Network status. You're connected to the internet. Okay. You have, uh, uh, Wi-Fi spectrum setup E5. Okay, so yeah, you are connected. Um, yeah. The the one thing that I'm seeing suggested in the chat room, and maybe you've already tried this. Have you tried turning off the Wi-Fi on your computer and then turning the Wi-Fi back on again on your computer, not at the router level, but on your computer itself? No. 
Okay, so that is something that you can try uh, first and foremost. And then um, we've got a link uh, to a support document that we're going to include in the show notes. That's at techguylabs.com, a link in the show notes that will uh, give you some other thoughts on what you might do to see if you can do that. Of course, you'll have to access it from a different device, uh, given that the browser is not working for you. But uh, unfortunately, I have to I have to run. I'm so sorry, Frank, that I wasn't able to help you more. Uh, But thank you for your time. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. And we are back from the break, and it's time for Dickie D. Bartolo. Hello. Hi, Dickie D. How are you today? Oh, let me get you, let me get your volume turned up. There we go. Now we can hear Dickie D. Oh, oh, great. Yeah, no. Leo, you look great. You oh. look like you lost 30 years on that cruise. Yes, my hair got, I uh, dyed my hair. Uh, oh, it's, I got a good tan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good to see you, Dickie. You know, D. I've been listening for a while. You're, you're doing an amazing job. Thank you. you. Know, uh, I mean, I'm going I'm to have to tell Leo you were terrible, but just so <laughs> I you know. Yeah. You, yeah, you know how this works. Yeah, yeah. we got we to gotta do what we got to do. Uh, so, well, joining... No, you're doing an amazing job. It's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dickie D joins us every week to talk about what I think are some pretty fun gadgets and gizmos. He is the gizmo wizard, which is why you can go to gizwiz.me or gizwiz.biz, which will show you all sorts of fun stuff. And uh, Dickie D, you're here to tell us about uh, something something exciting. Yeah, well, you know what? Do you have a Roku box? I do not, but a lot of my friends do. A lot of my friends love Roku. Okay. It's, yes. Uh, I have one and at Pepcom, we talked about this event last week, it's like 40 manufacturers there and with a product, a new product and usually a salesperson and maybe the guy who invented it. So Roku has what they call the Roku Ultra 2022 and I said to the guy, you didn't take the headphone jack out of the remote, did you? Because that's one that's of my the favorite best things. Thing that is one of the yes. best things that it has. Yes, they didn't get rid yes. of it, did they? they no, oh, he whew. said we've made two changes to the remote, but the headphone jack is still there. We put a microphone in the remote so you can talk to your Roku box through the microphone. Do you say, "Hey Roku, change the channel"? Yes, or? that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Got it. And uh, hey Roku, where are you? If you lose the remote, <laughs> that's and I nice. said, well. If you lose the remote, how's the microphone? He said, well, if the remote is so buried that the microphone in it can hear you so that it can start beeping, we also have a button on the main unit near your TV, Uh, and you hit that button, and that will get the remote to start beeping. And the the other change on the remote is that it's a rechargeable remote, so no batteries. Oh, that's Um, nice. Yeah, he said it'll run about two months. I mean, it's actually, it's going to depend on how often you uh, use your remote. Uh, but it adds a lot of things, and it was a little awesome uh, when I first plugged it in. Actually, after this long interview, I suddenly got a box, and they said, here, try this out yourself. So they added uh, Dolby Vision, Dolby Ooh. Atmos, Bluetooth, Apple AirPlay. Oh, it's got H- AirPlay, does it? Air, that's what it said, wow. HDR 10 plus. So anyway, suddenly, I don't know what's happening. And then a little thing comes up and it says, you have to make some adjustments to your TV. <laughs> I, I'm suddenly, wait, wh- what are you, you're in my TV now? <laughs> How are you here? So, <laughs> evidently, my TV is not set up for HDR 10 plus. I don't oh. even, high dynamic range, uh, but... So anyway, those are uh, a lot of the changes, and uh, uh, it's a hundred bucks. But I was just checking on Amazon. That's a really good price. It's Seventy-eight bucks. Really? On Amazon. Seventy-eight fifty. Honestly, even at a hundred dollars, that's a good price. Apple. Uh, that's the one that I use an Apple TV, and the Apple TV 4K is regularly more expensive than that. So I. This is a really good price for something that offers Dolby Vision, Dolby Atmos, and that uh, HDR <laughs> 10 plus uh, to minus seven. Uh, the algebra they make us do for these things these days. I swear. Yes, ex- exactly. And, and there's one other quick thing. I didn't realize that Roku made speed speakers with the boxes built into them. So if you have 
a small TV, you know, people with big TVs are going to put in mammoth systems. But if you have a small TV and you're interested, you can just check out the, the uh, Roku website because they make speakers with the Roku box built in. And then you can add on to them with wireless speakers. You can then add... Uh, more speakers and a wireless subwoofer. So they're doing a lot over there. So you're currently just blasting the audio over in Disneyland with your new setup, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't get the speakers. I, I, I'm just using the Roku box and uh, that little headphone. They even give you a set of headphones. Oh, nice. But of course, every, everybody's going to have their own headphones that they prefer to use. Yes, absolutely. I, again, I think that's one of the best features because uh, if you look at third party m uh, methods for doing that, that gets really expensive to have a set of headphones that work wirelessly with a TV. I think that was one of Roku's most brilliant things was building that those headphones into the, the remote. Absolutely. And when you live in an apartment, you know, people say, well, wh what are you talking about? You just have a little box. Here. Uh, you know, I, and I go to bed very late. I go to bed around two, between 2.30 and 3 a.m. And kidding. I go to bed, no, every night. And I go to bed watching train videos. Okay. So... It's great kind to of have training? headphones. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I wish I was learning, but I'm just watching. I, I watch some, if you go to YouTube and type in cab view train videos. Oh, so it's like you're running the train. It's, that is exactly right. That okay. is exactly now, right. Now, have you, and are it, you a train, have you done that before? Have you ever piloted, what is it called? Do you pilot a train? What do you do on a train? Uh, oh, you know, years and years ago, probably 15 years ago when Tech TV was out in San Francisco, um, I you could pay $150 to a railroad museum and they would give you an hour training on a diesel engine. Oh, wow. And and you get to drive it around. It's a, it was a, an abandoned uh, Navy yard and I got to drive a diesel train around the yard. That's yeah, and that train's cool. in my backyard. So, oh yeah, so this is the kind, you're, you're great. Yeah, if you happen to be watching the video version, you are like in the front of the locomotive and they have a lot of them in Switzerland and you go through mountains. It's a perfect way to fall asleep. This almost makes you, instead of the train conductor, you're the train itself almost. Yeah, that is exactly right. That is exactly right. The one problem with technology is now that railroads have welded rails, uh -huh. there's, I have to use a separate thing so I can get the clickety-click of, <laughs> of old time, tra you know, uh, wheels cr uh, crossing every 50 that feet. That ASMR hitting. you need. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I can imagine doing this in VR would be really... Oh, Something. that would be great. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's hard to fall asleep at those things. I right? imagine. That's not as comfortable. You'd get a little warm inside of there. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's cool. I got to say, though, the I'm used to your your uh, gadget picks being a little bit, you know, kooky. And this one's kind of... Yeah. So maybe you could uh, buy kind some of, stickers to put on it or something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, you're doing the show next Saturday, right? I am, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll find kooky for Saturday. Excellent. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to okay, it. Okay, buddy. Uh, well, um, folks, you can also uh, head over to the What the Heck Is It contest uh, by going to, again, gizwiz.biz or gizwiz.me uh, to participate and uh, try to figure out what the heck this is. Um, this week, I'm thinking it is a little place to store uh, negative film footage from disposable cameras that you can't get uh, processed in stores anymore so wow yeah yeah that's how i'm feeling wow i can't say right or wrong but i can say wow <laughs> uh i this is the one part where i have not studied up enough to know how all of this works but i do know that you can try to guess what that is and you can make up a silly answer you can get the right answer and depending on what happens you can get an autographed copy of mad magazine is that correct exactly we give 18 uh, 18 issues six for the right answer 12 for the kooky wrong answers awesome well, Dickie D, thank you for joining us. I do appreciate you uh, being here with it's us. Super, super, buddy. Uh, I, I'm thrilled. I'm looking forward to next week. Can't wait for the kooky. <laughs> Take care. Take care. All right, folks. We are just about to the end of this episode of the Tech Guy. Wow, it has been a ride, let me tell you. Uh, the Tech Guy radio show. Thank you for letting me be here with you today. Uh, and we will see you next time. Have a great Geek Week!
Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.